Vamos começar, então, a nossa sessão de hoje. Uh, today we will be speaking in English, because we have a lot of visitors in this morning. So it's my pleasure to start uh, our session two of our meeting workshop, NFI uh, 2022. I would like uh, just to say that uh, from my side, um, I would like to <laughs> so, dedicate, so to say, the session to my colleague and friend, uh, Ronald Scheller, that uh, I miss already a lot. And um, our science and education in Brazil will suffer a little uh, with his absence. So let's start our scientific program with uh, Professor Spencer Klein from Lawrence um, Berkeley. He will illuminate us <laughs> today with his uh, talk imaging gluons and parks in a nucleus using high energy photons. Professor, the word is yours, please. Thank you, Beatrice. It's um, nice to be here. Can you? Can you see my screen okay? Yes. It's perfect. Yes. And um, obviously, you know, I cannot see the chat. I'm happy to have um, questions um, during the talk. Um, you know, if anybody has them, um, you know, Beatrice or someone, please let me know. Um, so today I'm going to talk about imaging the gluons and quarks in a nucleus using high energy photons. I'll start out by reviewing. Um, quarks and gluons in nuclear matter, talk about photonic probes of nuclei, then ultra-peripheral collisions at RIC and the LHC, then move on to um, two sort of more physics topics, measuring gluon densities and imaging and gluon spatial distributions. And then I'll finally, I'll talk about the electron ion collider, which is the likely direction of this field, and then draw some conclusions. So, um, if you look in a pro at a proton um, and go back, say, 40 years, it was pretty simple. You had um, three valence quarks. This worked surprisingly well, particularly explaining things like proton spin. It's very easy to see how you can combine three spin one-half objects and get a spin one-half object. Um, but then if you look deeper, you see a picture more like on the right. You still have the three valence quarks but there are a bunch of evanescent quarks and uh, uh, quarks called C quarks and gluons. Um, and the proton looks like a much more complicated object when you include them. And, you know, things like explaining the proton spin becomes much more complicated. Um, the way we quantify these distributions um, is by looking at the part time densities in terms of two variables. There's Bjork and X. You can think of this as the fraction of the proton energy carried by the parton in the infinite energy frame, i.e., you know, if you give the, the give the proton infinite energy, what fraction is carried by a particular parton? And the Q squared, which is kind of a characteristic of the probe you use to look at it. And it's sort of a mixture measure of the microscope power. So if you look, you know, at um, very low Q squared things are kind of fuzzy and you might just see a single quark when then you, when you zoom in by going to higher Q squared, you see, um, you'll see that that quark is really a quark plus a gluon or a quark and a gluon and a quark and an anti-quark. And so if you go to lower X, i.e. higher energies or to higher Q squared, more partons are visible and the changes in the parton distribution uh, with X or Q squared are governed by things called evolution equations. And just to kind of give you an idea how things work, I have a plot at the bottom, which shows you what is measured at the Hera EP collider. And it's got, they have measured for proton Q quarks, um, which tend to be peaked at X of, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, down quarks peaked at about the same spot. These are the valence quarks and then things drop off. And then you have gluons, which at very high X, you don't see anything. That's because that's when this three valence quark picture applies. Then you go to lower X, you start to see gluons. And um, 
the gluon density rises um, kind of as a power law. And then there's a question, at what point does it start to turn over? And I'll say more about that later. You also see C quarks, and here this is visible. These are the strange quarks, and you know, which are notable. There's no va valence strange quarks to the lower X. They rise, and also the U and D quarks would rise as you go down to very low X. Um, so the way these things rise is sort of shown here, these diagrams. You have um, things like gluon splitting, one gluon splitting into two, or a gluon splitting into a quark and an anti-quark. Um, but then when you get to high enough densities, you can also have recombination phenomena. Two gluons will recombine to produce one. When you get to, and when you go to a region where the gluon densities or quark densities are high enough, the rates of splitting and recombination will be equal. And this is kind of an equilibrium known as saturation. It is also possible you might have other new phenomena, um, something called the colored glass condensate. This is essentially a classical gluon field. When the gluons get dense enough, you can describe them that way. Um, originally, when this was predicted in the early 2000s, it was thought to produce new phenomena such as monojets. You people thought that this classical gluon field could recoil as a whole. Um, we now no longer think that's true. It's mostly considered a calculational tool. Um, and so the whole question of understanding this high density partonic matter is a key goal of modern nuclear physics. Um, for those of you that work with relativistic heavy ion colliders, the key word is cold nuclear matter. This is what sort of the background, if you don't heat the nucleus up, it's a background understanding the signatures of the quark gluon plasma. Um, so um, things get a little more interesting when you take an isolated proton and put it in a nucleus. Um, the simple sort of traditional nuclear physics picture is the nucleons interact via pion exchange. But if you go down to you know, high Q squared, look closely, they may also interact via parton exchange. Another way of saying that is that if you take a proton and put it in, an iso in a heavier nucleus, the parton distributions will be altered when you do that. This is sort of quantified by changes in the parton distributions. The graph on the lower right shows what happens as a function of Bjork and X. Um, and you, you go down, you can see it's a pretty complicated curve with four different regions called out. You know, at very high X, and in fact, you can go X beyond one. Um, you can see the effect of Fermi motion of the nucleons in the nucleus. Some of them are moving in the same direction, so you can get higher energy quarks, perhaps with X greater than one. You go down to lower energies, there's a suppression called the EMC effect after the European muon. Uh, collaboration that observed it that's likely due to nucleon nuclear car correlations. And then at very low X, you get this shadowing region, which we think is due to this gluon recombination. And in the middle, there's this anti shadowing region where you get some pile up. And um, the important thing to think to remember is that, you know, is if you want to see these high density phenomena that I just talked about, like saturation. Um, nuclei are the place to go because the densities are higher. So for a given phenomena, will emerge at a higher or a larger Bjork and X in nucleus, nuclei than in protons. This increase in X is sometimes called the oomph factor, goes as A to the one third. It's about a factor of six for gold or lead. Um, the, so of course, to, to look at this, you need some way of measuring the gluon distributions. There are several that have been considered. Um, traditional one is in deep inelastic scattering, shown here. Uh, uh, an electron emits a virtual photon, which then interacts with the nucleus. Um, this is sensitive to the quark distributions in the nucleus. Um, and the nice thing is x and q squared are determined directly from the scattered electron doesn't really matter what happens to the ion. Um, and um, the gluons may be inferred from the evolution of the quark distributions. How does the quark density change with X or Q squared? You look at the change in X and that gives the gluons. But really direct measurements are very desirable. 
And for that, you want reactions that proceed via gluons. And there are a couple that are of interest. Um, one is photo productions of DiJet, open charm, or vector mesons. Excuse me, vector mesons should not be on that slide. And there you can think of what happens is the, the nucleus or a electron emits a photon, which fluctuates into a quark anti quark pair, which then interacts with the nucleus. And because you have these quarks, if you pick the right final state like jets or um, charm, um, it mostly interacts with the gluons in the nucleus. Um, the other reaction is shown below is photoproduction of vector mesons. Um, the nice thing about this is vector mesons are very clean experimentally. You have final states like J psi going to E plus E minus. Hard to find something simpler than that. Um, the disadvantage is to do that, you need to have two gluon exchange at least to preserve color. So there's a lot of theoretical complications, um, which I will be talking about. So the tool we use for this is something called ultra peripheral collisions. Um, ultra peripheral collisions occur when two nuclei pass by each other at an impact parameter B larger than two RA. So there are no hadronic interactions. Um, the, you know, because this comes from a nucleus, it could be a proton or heavier nucleus, the photons are nearly real. So if you want to study things in perturbative QCD language, you need to get a hard scale that comes from the final state. So for the J psi, what you have Q squared is the J psi mass over two squared. Um, the other thing to consider is that two photon reactions are also studied. Each nucleus can emit a photon and you get things like gamma gamma going to E plus E minus. Um, and this is a lot of interesting physics, which I don't have time to talk about, but it's also a very nice test of the photon flux calculations. Um, and the other thing you know, I wanna say is, you know, I talk about this B greater than two RA um, requirement that in some sense is necessary to see the reaction cleanly, but what we've seen over the last about five years is you also have these electromagnetic interactions even with hadronic interactions. So if you have a peripheral, very peripheral collision where the nuclei just kind of graze each other or even down to 50% centrality, um, you can also have these electromagnetic signatures and which we expected, what we didn't necessarily expect is that they would be quite visible and they are. So photons um, from rel can be come from relativistic nuclei via something called the equivalent photon approximation. This started by Fermi and then Weizsäcker and Williams took over. If you look at a relativistic nucleus and look outside of it, you'll see you have an electric field pointing radially outward and a B field that goes around the nuclei. So you have perpendicular E and B fields, just like a photon field. So you can just take this electric field as a function of X and B, um, and Fourier transform to a function of K and B and quantize. And this is all in um, the back pages of Jackson. Um, if you look at it from the side, you have this sort of pancaked, well, pancaked electromagnetic fields. Essentially, it's just Lorentz contracted with an opening angle one over gamma. And from this, you can see that the maximum energy is roughly the Lorentz was gamma H bar C over B. There's an equation here for photon flux with some Bessel functions in it. Um, and then to get the total photon flux, you integrate over your reaction conditions. You integrate over in transverse space over the impact parameter. Normally, you might limit this to B greater than 2RA, and then you can get this form shown here. Or if there are other conditions you want to apply, it's possible to integrate the photon field and find the total photon flux subject to those conditions. Um, so the interesting thing about this with UPCs is if you do this, particularly at the LHC, you get very, very high energies. Um, for lead-lead collisions at the LHC, in the target frame, i.e. in the frame of the other nucleus, you get energies up to 500 keV. So way, way, way higher than you can get um, in any fixed target experiment that corresponds to a gamma proton center of mass energy of about 700 GeV, or if you're doing gamma gamma, it's about 200 GeV. Um, if you do this with protons, the maximum energy cutoff is a little less well-defined, 
but it's somewhere around 10 times higher in the target frame and factor of four higher in the mass frame. Um, and the point is, you know, that you get extremely high energies. This is the energy frontier for photons. And that means you can probe down to very small Bjork and X of order X of 10 to the minus six. Um, so I said, you know, most of the UPC studies we've actually observed are pretty simple. J psi going to E plus C minus, rho going to pi plus pi minus. And to see these in UPCs, you need to see these charged particles and nothing else, i.e. have reasonable confidence. You, there's nothing else in the reaction that you missed. So this requires a detector with large angular acceptance plus coverage down to smallish order 100 MeV over C transverse momentum, i.e. you want a detector that's hermetic down to low PT. Um, also worth pointing out, nice thing about these exclusive reactions is if you're looking for coherent production, which is most of what we do, you can put a constraint, require that the PT of everything you see be less than order of 100 MeV over C. This also greatly reduces backgrounds. Um, of course, the difficulty here is triggering, you know, figuring out which of these events are interesting online. Um, and that is, you know, been the, the biggest experimental problem we face. It is starting to be great, significantly alleviated. Now, for example, Alice um, in run three will have a, have a flow through DAC. So it will record all of the data and that will disappear. Um, improvements and triggering are one of the main things that have driven improvements in UPC statistics over the last 20 years. Um, one other complication to mention is I talked about exchanging a single photon between two nuclei. You may also, you know, because Z alpha is large, you may also exchange additional photons, which cause the nuclei to break up and or occasional, produce the occasional pion from delta excitation. And um, those are a bit of a complication. Uh, I don't have time to go into it very much though. Um, but point I want to make is at this point, all four LHC detectors plus STAR and Phoenix at RIC have studied UPCs. This has become, you know, it's no longer just a cottage industry. It's a mainstream technique. So to talk about, show you one example of the quality of the data, I'd like to spend a few minutes on this STAR paper looking at gamma gamma to E plus C minus, where here we have plots of the pair mass the pair PT and the cosine theta star, the basically the decay angle and the gamma gamma the center of mass frame, and is compared with a couple of calculations. And you can see that the, the agreement is quite good. But the thing I really want to emphasize is the size of the error bars. We have very high statistics samples. We now have quite good control of systematics. We are able to measure what's going on. And in many cases, we are ahead of the theory. Um, so now turning to um, photo production, this is a talk result from Atlas on photo production of digets. So essentially one nucleus emits a photon which scatters off of the other because then it fluctuates to a quark anti quark pair, each of which forms a jet. Um, so this is a single gluon exchange, the nucleus breaks up, but those, those products are safely out of the way. So it's um, Theoretically clean, you get one rapidity gap. I mean, there's a rapid, there is a, you know, the other one is kind of filled in. Um, the Bjork and X depends on digit masses and rapidity for the conditions that Atlas applied, which are given here. You know, the jets of PT more than uh, leading jet more than 20 GeV, digit mass more than 35 GeV. They cover the region X of 10 to the minus two and one and Q squared between 1600 GeV squared and 40,000 GeV squared. They compared the, the data with um, a starlight Pythia hybrid. Uh, if you look here, there are some differences um, and they were trying to see, is this due to the detector or is it due to nuclear modifications to the PDFs? Um, their last report I heard, and this is unfortunately from 2017, this has sadly not been published, um, they were working on an unfolding to really probe the gluon distributions. 
Um, but at this point, it looks like a very nice proof of principle of what's possible. So turning to exclusive vector meson production, um, this is a more complicated process. As I've said, photon comes in, fluctuates to a quark anti-quark pair, and you can think of it as elastically scattering off of the nucleus, i.e., you know, there's a, no quantum numbers exchange or noise of the vacuum, vacuum, and emerging is a real vector meson. It's just, it, you can think of this as a gluon ladder, something we call a pomeron. You know, lowest order is two gluons, but then you look in more detail and there's many more gluons in there. Um, if we're talking about production of light vector mesons like the rho, direct pi pi, pi minus, omega, rho prime, et cetera, this can be described in the language of vector meson dominance. For heavy mesons like this J psi, psi prime, and the epsilon family, we usually treat them with perturbative QCD. Um, there are, for the target here, I've shown the target remaining intact. If you look closer, really there's three different possible targets with their own different coherence length and PT, square, PT scales. Um, in coherent production, the nucleus remains intact and the typical PT is H bar over RA, uh, in order of less than 100 MeV. And there the cross section, like very naively, it should, should be D sigma DT goes as A squared. You can also have an incoherent production where the nucleus breaks up, but the individual protons remain intact. There the typical PT square scale is H bar over the proton radius. And finally, you can have proton dissociation. The struck proton breaks up or is excited. And there, the typical PT square scale is lambda QCD of order 300 MeV. Um, and when I talk about experimental data, you'll see these three regions. Um, an important point to make is that the rapidity maps into the photon energy. The photon energy is given by the vector meson mass of a two times e to the plus or minus y. The reason there's this plus or minus y is there's a twofold ambiguity as to which nucleus emitted the photon and which is the target. And mid rapidity, those two cases give you the same energy. But if you move away from mid rapidity, you have a high energy solution and a low energy solution. And the cross section is the sum of two directional cross sections. In fact, these two cases are indistinguishable. So instead of adding the cross sections, you add the amplitudes. And in fact, you can even have destructive interference. Um, you can also have a case photon interacting with a hypothetical particle called the auteron, which is a three gluon state, which could lead to tensor mesons or other a wider range of final states. Um, this has not been observed, but people are looking for it. Um, can of course also explain this in lowest order perturbative QCD in the, you know, in leading order PQCD, this is two gluon exchange. The cross section is given here and the effective Q squared is given by the Q squared of the photon, which is essentially zero for UPCs and the vector meson mass, which gives you a hard scale. Um, and there are a bunch of caveats here. One is the PQCD factorization doesn't strictly hold. These two gluons have different X values. Um, you can handle this by using generalized or skewed gluon distributions. So smallish correction. There's also something you would do called the Shuvayev transformation to avoid that. Um, also this photon is not a pure QQ bar dipole. And there's questions about the choice of scale mu. So if I was giving this talk um, a month ago, I would have added some other caveats here and say we don't expect a whole lot of difference when we get to NLL. However, about a month ago, this nice paper shown here um, presented the first um, JSI photo production calculation in next to, learning, next to leading order. And we found some surprises in there. And I would say this paper is still being discussed a lot in the community. And it, the implications are not yet fully clear. Um, so this is a rough time to give this talk, um, but this is my take on it. So first of all, the paper finds a very, very large scale uncertainty. Orders of magnitude, if you vary the scale 
between um, the usual, uh, you know, charm quark mass and twice that, and you get an orders of magnitude change. Um, you can see that the optimal scale on this paper, 2.37 GeV, gives a good description of the data. Um, so, you know, there may be some hope. There's also some hope for reducing the width of this pink band using some tricks that I don't have time to go into. Um, the second um, thing that's a surprise is the le next to leading order cross section is 55 to 70 percent below the leading order calculations. Um, you know, and they did their own leading order calculation for this. It's a little surprising that you know in this view that the previous leading order calculations match the data. Um, but the um, calculation is actually relatively complicated. If you look at this plot in the middle, which is for JSI photo production and UPCs, you can see there's this multi-hump structure. It's not a simple monotonic behavior. Um, the reason for this is that the next to leading order gluon contribution partially cancels the leading order gluon contribution, reducing the total gluon contribution. And this gives room for the quark contribution to become important. And of course, there's also interference going on. And the plot on the bottom right shows the difference components. Um, and this just basically tells you this calculation is more, more complicated than we might have expected. There's a lot going on here. Um, and one um, fallout of that is because of this, you know, different parton distribution fits give different results. And the difference is due to the real part of the gluon amplitude. And um, so, you know, at least now with this current calculation, the uncertainties are large enough. It's a little hard to see how you would use this to extract gluon distributions from the data. Um, but there is hope to make progress, either used by reducing this scale uncertainty using some tricks, or the other thing to do would be to use gamma P data shown here to fix the scale and then apply that scale to proton to gamma ion data. Um, that it's not completely clear that that is possible, um, but it seems like it should work fairly well. More thought is needed. Um, so another calculation, which at this point is just to leading order, something called the dipole count approach. And this is not comes about because we need to incorporate transverse size in the calculation. So here, you know, you start with the basic, the cross section is just given by the usual quantum mechanical thing. And there are three inputs, the photon wave function, the vector meson wave function, and the matron, matrix element. And um, sort of simple approach is you treat the QQ bar pair as a dipole with size R. Um, if you start looking more deeply, there's a lot of choices. There are different, slightly different photon wave functions you can use, a number of different vector meson wave functions, and a fair number of different matrix elements. Um, there's one based on perturbative QCD. You include shadowing. You can put in a colored glass condensate. But essentially, with this ingredient, you map this into this equation here, which gives you the amplitude. Um, so you you know, integrating over the dipole size, integrating over where it strikes the nucleus, and then you have the, um, the wave functions. Um, and this is very nice because it allows impact parameter dependent calculations, and you can calculate the sigma dt for different nuclear conditions, i.e. for different nuclear shapes, sizes, etc. So moving on to data, um, this is uh, row photo production. And again, this is partly just to see the quality of the data. On the left, we have Alice. On the right, we have star. Um, this is just the dipion mass. And you can barely see the experimental error bars, even with a very large number of bins on the right. And this, you know, shall compare here with a fit based on components from the row zero plus direct, direct pi plus pi minus which is where the photon fluctuates to a pi plus pi minus, and also a component from omega going to two pions, which produces this kink here. Um, and the ratios of these three components in the phase angle are consistent with lower energy fixed target studies, consistent with Palmeron exchange at high energies, meson exchange or 
Regiot exchange at lower energies. Um, the cross section um, can be calculated in the Glauber model. I've talked about gamma P cross sections. You can go to gamma A cross sections with a Glauber model, which accounts for the fact that dipoles going through a heavy nucleus can multiple scatter, i.e. interact many times. There are two um, different um, approaches to this. And on Glauber model, the dipole does not change as it travels through the nucleus, although you can have other on-shell vector mesons. There's a more sophisticated approach called the glauber griboff model, where the dipole may take on excited virtual intermediate states as it travels through the nucleus. And what we see from both star and alleys is you need this glauber griboff model to explain the data. The Glauber cross sections are alone are considerably higher. Um, we've also looked at the row photoproduction as a function of the target. Um, in addition to um, proton targets and gold and lead, there's also um, the LHC did a six hour xenon xenon run in 2017, which was analyzed similar to the lead lead data. Cross section was again seemed consistent with this Glauber Grebuff calculations. But one nice thing about having these three points is you can fit it to a line and you find that the cross section goes as A to the 0.96. Um, this is nice because if you did not have nuclear shadowing, you know, which you can think of as being described by this Glauber Grebuff calculation, you'd expect an A to the four thirds cross section. Um, I think I'm going to skip this in the interest of time and move on to heavy quarkonia photoproduction. Um, and here, you know, this physics goal, at least before this NLL paper, was to extract gluon distributions. Um, you know, there's no HERA data with ion targets, so we know almost nothing or very little about what happens to ion parton distributions for x less than 10 to the minus 3 some data from LHC, but not a lot. Um, and here, you know, as we try, even before this paper came out, what we try and do is calculate a suppression relative to proton targets, because many of the theoretical uncertainties cancel. Um, sometimes we don't have proton targets, and we use something called the impulse approximation as a reference. This treats the target as a collection of independent nucleons, and is, you know, should be quite good, adequate. Um, and uh, we expect, don't expect the data to match that. We expect this, you know, shadowing again because a single dipole may interact with multiple nucleons in a heavy target. One nice sort of benchmark is something called the leading twist shadowing, which you just explained this in terms of multiple shadowing. You might also have changes in the gluon distribution, which would appear as an additional suppression. So this um, plot here shows measurements from a number of places from HERA and from the LHC UPCs, data from LHCB and ALICE um, on the cross section for gamma P going to JSIP. Um, and you can see it looks pretty darn close to a straight line except from the region near threshold. And there's a possible downturn here if you look really, really carefully, the LHCB solutions aren't completely consistent here. There's some tension. Um, the power law is interesting because as long as you stick to lowest order PQCD, if the gluon distribution is described by a power law as is shown here, then the gamma P cross section is also um, described by this power law. And this tells you something that I find a little surprising is, you know, this leading order calculation looks pretty good. Um, and there's not a huge amount of room for NLO here, unless there's a cancellation, something happens to the gluon distributions at the same time as the calculation gives you something different. And I will stress this is, um, and it, what's labeled here NLO is calculation is older, it's only partial NLO. Um, and the thing I should mention is there's actually two techniques here. I've mentioned this twofold photon ambiguity, um, and Alice and LHCB dealt with it in different ways. Alice studied PA collisions 
where the proton is usually the target, you can also use the PT spectrum to differentiate between proton and, and lead targets. Um, LHCB in the proton-proton data, they had the twofold ambiguity. They used Hera data to kind of fix one of the solutions. Um, moving on to um, JSI photocorrection on gold, there's some very nice data from Rick, which has unfortunately also not been published. Um, but you can see here, you know, they have done some very nice work. You can see there's the JSI here and the Psi prime sticking up and above a continuum from gamma gamma going to dileptons. And this gamma gamma dileptons is actually relatively large under these conditions, but you can still see these peaks. And then they look at the PT spectra for emissions with different numbers of neutrons. If you select cases where you have a neutron, you can see that there's a large component from incoherent photoprotection because that causes the nucleus to break up. If you select events where there are no neutrons in the zero degree calorimeter, you get a PT spectrum that's peaked at much smaller PT and coherent photoproduction is very dominant. Um, the other thing that STAR has done, and this is unfortunately just at the proof of principle level, is to look at polarized JSI photoproduction. The nice thing is that this is sensitive to polarized generalized parton distributions, which probe this transverse position of partons in the nucleus. Um, unfortunately, the data is not yet good enough to say anything, but this is something that is looks very nice for the future. Um, there's also data on Psi prime product, photo production. The left is from LHCB on a proton target. The right is on, um, on lead um, from Ellis. And you can see again for the JSI, you get, looks like a good power law. Of course, the error bars are much larger. Um, not too much more to say there. The gamma A data shows this moderate suppression um, of glue of production compared to a gamma P reference as with the JSI that I will get to. Um, there's also data on the epsilon from CMS at the bottom and LHCB at the top. Um, nice thing is you can see the three epsilon peaks are resolved. It's not something to be taken for granted. It's not that simple. They're pretty close together. Um, and there's, they see the agreement with this partial NLO calculation to the same calculations that match their JSI data, but at different Q squared. Um, you know, the expectation for and the interest in going to the upsilon, you have a higher Q squared, you're less sensitive to some theoretical uncertainties, um, but you also get larger differences between leading order and this partial NLO calculation than the JSI. Um, so, uh, this plot shows the Alice data on lead lead going to JSI, and they've measured the PT spectrum. Um, and you can see there's this peak at very low PT that I've mentioned. This is coherent photoproduction. And then this red curve shows the incoherent photoproduction. And this sort of magenta curve going out to very high PT shows this proton breakup. Um, component and they fit for these and get a very nice agreement with the data. And then the coherent cross-section shown here, looking at the forward data, um, you know, you see a significant suppression from this impulse approximation. And then you're below this sort of starlight model, which um, just does a Glauber calculation and it's compatible with some other calculations and in the zone of this greenish band, which is the EPS09, which is a parameterization of the nuclei suppression of partons based on other data. And it's nice to see the UPC data fix. Spencer, five yeah. minutes is fine for you. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to skip some things then. Um, so this just shows the inferred nuclear shadowing. Um, you know, basically you get this moderate shadowing. Um, I guess I don't have time to go through this, but I wanted to point out, you can go beyond gluon densities and look at spatial distributions and fluctuations using the good Walker formalism, which links coherent and incoherent production to the average nuclear configuration and event by event fluctuations. Essentially what this tells you 
is that the coherent um, photo production, the sigma coherent DT can be Fourier transformed to give you the transverse distribution of the targets within the nucleus using this curve equation here. There are multiple serious caveats I don't have time to go into, but in principle, this looks very interesting. Star did a, did a proof of principle on this where they measured the d sigma dt. They fit the incoherent d sigma dt at very large t with a dipole form factor, extrapolated to small t and subtracted, leaving d sigma coherent dt in the middle, in the, shown in the middle plot. You can see diffractive minima here and here. And then they did this Fourier transform and got this curve shown here. And at least near the edges of the nucleus, it looks pretty um, straightforward. At the small end, you can see that varying the maximum T used in this transform gives you a large uncertainty due to windowing. Um, they have also more recently, as in a few months ago, done a fit to the data using a much more sophisticated model that accounts for the interference between these two directions that I mentioned, which gives you this correlation between the pi n directions and the rho, rho directions, gives you an angular modulation based on this difference. When they do this, they're able to do a very nice fit and get very precise measurements of the hadronic radius, i.e. including the neutron scan of gold and uranium. And this is sort of introducing the era of precision UPC physics, using it for very precise measurements. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. Um, Alice has done something a little simpler. They look at the PT spectrum for JSI photo production. They remove the resolution and the photon PT using the deconvolution with some caveats. You can see that the data shown here falls off faster than you would expect from the lead form factor. The effective nucleus is a bit larger, it's consistent with this leading twist approximation or a dipole model with gluon saturation. Um, the incoherent cross section, because it's measuring the difference where you average oh, the amplitudes versus averaging the cross section, is sensitive to event by event fluctuations in the nuclear configuration, including the positions of individual nucleons and glue on a cut spots, essentially. This probes the deviations from the mean. Unfortunately, the correlations between T, when you measure the sigma DT and input parameter, are weaker than with coherent production, but you can still test models. Um, Heike Matasari and Schenk did a very nice um, example of this when they looked at gamma star P going to JSI at Hera and glue on a cut spots. They fit both the coherent and incoherent cross sections and consider two models, a round proton shown in blue and a fluctuating proton, the black lines. And you can see that, you know, the both gave a sort of decent um, fit to the coherent cross section, but the incoherent cross section with the round proton is too low by an order of magnitude, but the fluctuating proton works. And in their model, you know, the average proton is not a good thing to talk about. But if you look at individual protons that collide, look at the gluon density, you know, this shows four examples on the right. This is one of the things we're very interested in looking at with the electron ion collider. Um, this gets even more interesting with nuclei because as you go to large, you know, higher and higher photon energies or lower X values, you get more gluons and more hot spots. Eventually, the whole, whole surface is covered with hot spots, and you essentially have a black disk. The nucleus acts like a totally absorbed black disk. Um, black disks don't fluctuate, so, inco in so incoherent photo production should disappear. So what you expect to happen as you increase the photon energy is the cross-section work should rise, reach a maximum, and then turn over. Um, and that turn position of that turnering point depends on the mass of the vector meson. This is something that would be very exciting to probe in more detail. We're starting to put points on this plot. Um, I think I will skip UPCs and peripheral collisions. You know, we'll just say, you know, photon reactions do not disappear when B is less than 2 RA. 
Um, the rates are lower. There's a lot of interesting questions about coherence uh, disappearing and hadronic interactions, et cetera. But um, there's data for both gamma gamma to, to dilatons and JSI photo production for you know, the in peripheral collisions. Um, so looking ahead, LHC run three, which is starting now, and run four will have much higher luminosity and improved detectors. Alice in particular will add a much improved vertex detector for open charm and a streaming DAC, eliminating the need for a trigger, removing a huge bottleneck. There's also, I'm personally very excited, there's gonna be a short oxygen oxygen run. This is probably an excellent place to measure incoherent photo production. Um, anyway, you know, expect to have precision vector meson photo production, dig more digets, open charm, JSI transverse distribution studies, sort of like what I showed you with the star at the row, but for the JSI. Um, looking further ahead, if the, there's a future CERN or Chinese 100 TeV Hadron Collider, we can get down to Bjork and X of 10 to the minus seven. Um, but then in the 2030s, the exciting thing is the proposed US electron ion collider. Um, the current design involves adding an 18 GeV electron ring to the RIC complex and augmenting the ion run to increase the energy a little bit to 275 GeV protons. Um, it will also have coherent electron cooling to reduce the beam emittance, give a very high luminosity of order 10 to the minus 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second. You know, we'll do a lot. It does not have the same reach in Bjork and X as UPCs, but it will be able to do precision physics. Um, plan is for at least one detector, which will have a full acceptance or as close as we can get to it with excellent forward and backward coverage. Um, the EIC is an idea that had been around for a long time, but in the last two years, it's picked up enormous momentum. It's received in Department of Energy parlance, critical decision zero and critical decision one. Um, you're moving ahead with the design. Collaboration is forming now, and we expect completion in the early 2030s. And you know, this will really be the centerpiece of the US nuclear physics program then. Um, and I would encourage people who are interested, you know, this is a great time to get involved. There's a lot going on. So my conclusions, photo production is a key tool to study partons in dense nuclear environments. The LHC is the energy frontier, probing gluons down to Bjork and X of 10 to the minus six. Photo production of open tar charm and digets are theoretically fairly clean. But messy experimentally, I think you know we will get them, but they're not the first thing to do. Photo production of corconium is experimentally straightforward, with results on many mesons, including the rho, rho prime, j psi, psi prime, and upsilon. Um, the j psi photo production cross section on proton targets is reasonably well described by a simple power law as predicted if gluon distributions also follow a power law. Light meson production on nuclei is well described by the glauber griboff paradigm that accounts for multiple dipole interactions. JSI photo production on lead shows a moderate suppression of the cross section consistent with the leading twist model of shadowing and with the favored regions of nuclear PDFs. And looking ahead, we expect much photo production data from Rick runs three and four and the future electron ion collider. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Let's open for a question. I've asked uh, Jovan to help me with that, if we can see hands. Do you see hands, Jovan? There's a question in the chat. In the chat, yeah. Yeah, I saw that one in the chat. I, I cannot see the chat right now. Let's see if I can translate to you the question in the chat. Uh, 
Okay, when we give energy to a particle. Oh yes, if uh, the particle <laughs> accelerates, if it has a change in, in size. I think it's about Lorentz contraction. We're going to talk about this. Um, um, yes. Huh. So about, uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, well, you know, this is an, I mean, um, I'm not sure I quite get it, you know, we, yeah, when the particle accelerates, if it has a change in the size, if it, it, it expands or sh sh shortens, shrinks, um, um, because the person saw uh, when we are talking about uh, eons, uh, he could think uh, could be an asymmetry coming from that. Yes. Yeah, so um, when we have an eye, you know. So Tavio. Yeah, I mean, we for most of what. I'm talking about, you know, we, we assume, of course, the ions do Lorentz contract. For a lot of what I'm looking for, you know, I talked about things fluctuating, the photon fluctuating to a dipole. What I didn't talk about is how long that fluctuation lives. And we think in most cases, the fluctuation lives more than long enough to get through the entire nucleus. So indeed, it is a pancake, but it wouldn't, well, I mean, you have to have Lorentz transform contraction for this to work. But you know, the, the dipole goes through the ion, and it, I think that would be true even if we're not Lorentz contracted. I'm not sure if that's helpful or not. But... Okay. More questions. More questions? So I'd like, um, um, meanwhile, if Ralph. people are thinking their questions. Ah, Half has a question. Yeah, Spencer, uh, thanks a lot. Um, my question is, do you see fluctuations? Like um, there is this idea of having the nuclei being in, in different configurations from each, uh, from collision to collision. And um, that you actually are really sensitive to it, or is it really more or less an average that you see? This is um, well. We, there are different approaches to describe it, of course, but um, so, I don't know whether, whether you can really measure this. Yeah. Um, you're, so you're talking about things like color transparency. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but um, let's say that you really see it in the geometric way. Uh, what what you write down here is, of course, what I what what the effect is of the fluctuations in general. But um, okay, so, but please go ahead. Hmm? So this in this good Walker paradigm, you know, and I don't have time to go into the caveats. You know, this gives you a fairly direct way to measure the fluctuations. Essentially, you know, you're measuring the deviations from the mean on an event by event basis. So that, i.e., the fluctuations. What we have seen, you know, the the, the difficulty is incoherent um, production is not that easy to measure. Um, but you know, so essentially, what this Hera data shown here is the by far the best example we have. You know, and it is you know shows the you know the coherent cross section is not very sensitive to fluctuations. You know, you can see. The blue line and the black line are pretty similar, but this incoherent cross section is sensitive to fluctuations in the the proton configuration. You might be asking about, you know, can we see sort of fluctuations in the dipole? I don't immediately know of one, but you know, if you're in, for the proton target, you know, this is um, a beautiful demonstration, you know, of measuring fluctuations. Um, you know, other, other approaches such as color transparency, people have been studying for a long, long time and the data is just not nearly as clear. There's lots of discussions about other um, 
you know, other explanations and, you know, trying to remove all of the other hadronic effects is not easy. Whereas, you know, this, I don't know of anybody who is skeptical about this. Um, what we would like to do, of course, is apply it to nuclei. That turns out to be quite a bit harder, but there are efforts, you know, there have been um, some measure, effective measurements of incoherent photoproduction, although not always presented as such. You know, this, this star data shown here, this um, power law here, um, you know, is consistent, you know, is incoherent production. Um, unfortunately, this is not, nobody has really used this to talk about nuclear fluctuations, but it could be done. And there are certainly groups working on it. Um, okay, thanks, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question, if there is no one, another one. Uh, you mentioned uh, that um, you can have with gamma gammas in LHC, uh, re like reaching an X, uh, as below as 10 to the minus x, six. Uh, as, I, as far as I understand, this is mostly the goal of Foucault to reach this value of x that low. But right. again, then with Foucault. Ah, uh, so. Um, yes, that's it. Yeah, so. This, this transparency. I, I, what I wanted to mention is, you know, there's, you know, the, the photon energy, you know, is, is related to the rapidity is e to the minus y. So the way that Focal will get to low X values is going by very far forward rapidity. And Focal goes further in rapidity than LHCB does, so it can reach somewhat lower X values. And this is both, that is, you know, the, that exponential is true both for hadronic interactions and for UPCs. And we are definitely interested in looking at JSI photo production in the Focal, and that appears to be possible. And again, um, this uh, recent work of a scholar uh, concerning next leading order, um, yes. how much uh, this could um, disturb our calculations and uh, good results that we get for JPE size con comparing with experiments? Um, well, if, state the obvious, it's not going to change the experimental data. But the no, the experimental data not, but our theory is. <laughs> yes, uh, I don't, I do not know. This came out a month ago. We had a very nice discussion in the Ali's um, UPC uh, PAG. Um, and, you know, I think most people were um, quite concerned by it. You know, one question, I mean, there are many questions. One is, you know, how much can you do with this scale reduction? I mean, if you could get, if you could eliminate the scale uncertainty, you could probably deal with the fact that the quark contributions are, are important, you know, you know, in the end, what you would like to do is to take this data and plug it into a, one of the part fits that determine parton distributions. And if it has to be both quarks and gluons rather than just gluons, you can live with that. But, you know, the scale uncertainty, we need to weigh, you know, need to find a way to deal with that. And the question is how well can you deal with it by using, you know, proton target data to fit the scale and apply it to EA or will some of these tricks work well enough to be immediately useful? Um, this is, um, you know, this is all very new, remains to be seen. I um, mean, the other thing of course, was we'd like to understand what happens with the dipole model calculations at full NLO? I mean, that could get, um, you know, that could easily get quite hairy. You know, I mean, the whole point of the dipole is you think of it as a quark and an anti quark, you know, separated by a distance r. If you want to do NLO, then you have to deal with the fact that there are gluons in there. And, you know, that seems to me rather difficult. You probably know more about that than I do. Okay, I'm. I would like to be discussing with you more half an hour, but I think we are supposed yeah. to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like yeah. to thank you for this talk, and I know it's, it starts very early in the morning for you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank thank you for having me. It's been 
You have to move Enjoy on. Giving Thank it. you very much. Maybe so start sorry. sharing. Yeah. There. Thank you. Professor Hoff, Hoff Engel now. Okay, yeah. But so we have Professor Hoff Engel from Karlsruhe Institute. I studied very close there at Strasbourg. So astro and particle physics uh, with high energy messages of the universe. The word is yours. Thanks a lot. So, okay, um, yeah. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, I must admit when I started to prepare the talk, I realized that it's really very hard to cover the subject in 40 minutes. And so I had to drop most of the things I really wanted to talk about. But let's see what we can manage to do. Now, the typical mighty messenger picture that we have in modern astroparticle physics you see here. You have an astrophysical source, be it a black hole with an accretion disk, a jet or something like that. It produces particles, typically protons, but it could be also ions like in, uh, helium, carbon, nitrogen, heavier, iron or nickel. They get accelerated, they interact either in the jet or somewhere else and produce secondary particles like pi naughts, charged pions decaying into muons or to photons, etc. And you get um, this plethora of secondary particles is written here, propagating. And the charged particles, of course, get deflected. So that's the image of a magnetic field map. This is uh, neutrinos, this is gamma rays. And uh, depending on the energy of the charged particle, they might be almost on a rectilinear trajectory or they might be completely deflected. So that's really difficult to say how they propagate. Now, if we look at what we know now from the data, and that's one of the famous plots that Marcus Ahlers made already in 2017, if you plot the flux we observe at Earth, multiplied by the energy of the particle squared, then this is a special plot. It's actually the energy per logarithmic bin. Uh, so, in, And if you integrate over one decade, when integrate here over one decade, you actually can compare the heights and you know it's the same energy content. And the particles at the very highest energies, like here the OG flux, have essentially the same energy content as the neutrinos seen by ice cube. These are two neutrino measurements of ice cube, or for example, what the isotropic gamma ray background is that the Fermi civil light measures. So they all are in the, in the same order of magnitude, well, really tantalizing close. That means it's the same energy you put in the components. So you could convert this energy of the particles completely to neutrino energy and you would arrive here or to gamma ray energy. It's like an equipartition, except that uh, you are at different ranges in the spectrum. And so maybe those things all have something to do with each other. And that's of course something we implicitly assume in such a picture. Now, if we go to the energy frontier, and Spencer mentioned LHC as energy frontier, but in astrophysics, it's, it would be like cosmic rays with 10 to the 20 electron volts. You would have to use LHC and make it bigger and expand it to the size of the planet Mercury with the same superconducting magnets and fields to accelerate protons in this new accelerator to 10 to the 20 electron volts. If you don't scale anything else, just size. And that's one of the reasons why already years ago, it was considered as one of the major science questions for the next century to solve the question where those particles come from. And one of the things is, of course, if you want to accelerate them conventionally, you have to keep those particles magnetically trapped for some time. And if you have a certain field strength, you have a certain size of the region where you trap them, you find a, a line because it's the maximum energy is essentially charge, magnetic field, and size of the object all multiplied. And everything on this side from such a line can do it easily, uh, but everything on this side can't. And most of the astrophysical objects we know are on this side, so we have a hard time to accelerate particles to energies of 10 to the 20 electron volts for protons. Iron, of course, uh, 26 times charged would be a little bit more moderate here. And that's what already Hillas wrote down in 1984. 
Okay, now we do have some sources we hope that they can do it. It's like supermassive black holes producing jets, and this you have to think of as the size of a galaxy. Jets are much larger. This is a close-up with the black hole here of the accretion disk. We think rapidly spinning neutron stars can do it, or, for example, merging black holes that have then a spin flip. Initially, the alignment of the rotation axis was here. The new one is here. And we see this in astrophysics not so rarely. Or what is called a gamma ray burst, which could be a hypernova or a merger of two compact objects producing this gigantic explosion. And you expect from theory different kinds of power laws, how you inject particles from the sources. And the canonical one is e to the minus 2. This is what you typically look at. Now, if we look at our scenario and assume we had protons with e to the minus 2 injected, and because it's multiplied by e square, that's a flat line, then it turns out if you propagate those protons from distant sources to Earth, the spectrum changes this way. And the reason is that the protons interact with the microwave background and produce secondary particles, like over through a delta resonance or other things, like a neutron pion or proton pi naught, and that always uh, leads to an energy loss of roughly 20%. And it happens very often at high energy because you go in a, in a region where the microwave background really is uh, like opaque for those particles, and, uh, and then it changes. And you really get the spectrum nicely described in first approximation. You don't get this part that could come from another contribution. Of course, there is also E plus E minus production with a lower threshold. This, by the way, makes this almost dip here is coming from this feature here, which is also mainly on the microwave background. So we understand this part. If you had protons as primaries, we could describe the spectrum. And uh, those energy losses are important, but if you want to observe those particles, what is also important is that our universe is having filaments, clusters, sheets, voids, different magnetic fields. We have the galaxy. If a particle comes from a distant source, it will propagate through whatever. If you simulate that, and um, we don't know exactly how to simulate it, but in first approximation, like the red dots could be sources that are in a reasonable distance that they can reach us with particles with the energy loss. And the black dots you see here are arriving particles. And with the energy spectrum, you see this is smeared out. According to the magnetic fields, this grayish part is the field of view of the detector. And so you expect actually to see certain parts of the sky where you see a correlation between the source and the arriving particles, like source here, particles here. And this is what we are, want to look for. Okay, and we use the PRG observatory in this case because it has a very large um, contribution from Brazil. I want to emphasize it also here. Uh, and uh, it's a very sophisticated installation. Meanwhile, over the years, it has grown with a lot of water Cherenkov tanks, fluorescence telescopes, where, for example, the Brazilian groups have built the shutters and the, um, the apertures and, uh, and also wrote the first reasonable simulation that really worked very well. And, and all this is um, what we use to measure those particles. And of course, we have LIDARs to measure the atmosphere. We have radio antennas to measure radio passes. We have underground muon detectors, a lot of things working together. And what we really do is the particle cascade, uh, the particles come in, produce a cascade here. And if, the, if it's a dark night, we measure the fluorescence light. So like a UV light flash in the atmosphere and can reconstruct this longitudinal shower profile. And essentially for all the time, whether it's day or night independent, we measure the footprint of those showers. And so we get a longitudinal profile sometimes, 10% or so, or 15% of the time, and essentially always this footprint. And sometimes if we are lucky, if it's falling into a radio ray, we also see radio passes that are produced by the electron positrons in the shower due to the geomagnetic field and the charge excess that uh, exists in showers. What do we see? Now, I can't explain really how we do all, do all the reconstruction, but I think Carola already mentioned uh, part of that yesterday. What we see is actually a spectrum, the energy spectrum. And the energy spectrum is surprising. Why? Uh, let me go back. This was what we expected from theory, like a completely smooth behavior. And what we really see is a kink here that we call instep. 
we do see a suppression here, but it doesn't look like an exponential one we expect. It's more like a power law one. And we do see features here like the anchor that could be all right, and that is already lower energy where other contributions could matter. That actually has really caused a lot of attention as you see in the, like the viewpoint here and, and the different publications. And um, so that is something that is a bit surprising and we are still working on understanding that. Now, if you want to understand what particles we are actually looking at, that is shown here. We look at the golden set we have of data that where we have longitudinal profiles. And this is, for example, a measured longitudinal profile over the depth in the shower, in, in the atmosphere, excuse me. This is like top of the atmosphere, this is ground level. And this is one shower with the points. And I have simulated 10 additional showers with Monte Carlo to show how they look like if they were proton showers or if they were from iron nuclei or if they are gamma ray showers. And you see gamma ray showers penetrate deeper, iron not quite as deep as protons, and iron fluctuates less. So if you look at the mean uh, depth of the shower maximum here, you can draw lines for protons and for iron for different hadronic interaction models that describe this cascade. And for photons, you get this one. And there are effects like the lander pomeranchuk mikla effect, and there are pre-showering the geomagnetic field at extremely high energies. We would love to see that, but we haven't got the photons for it. But let's see. This is what it is. And here is a world data set, and one set of points is actually the OG set of points. So what do we learn from that? We do have to compare our data with simulations, and this is hydronic interactions. We need to simulate the showers. And if you look at the energies that are of relevance, we are measuring in this range. So this is OG data points here, the red ones, as a flux shown here over energy. And if you scale it to the center of mass energy, you see LHC is here in this range, roughly 10 to 17. And we want to go to this energy here. So we, we have to go an order of magnitude higher, basically, to 100 TeV center of mass to really go into our energy range that we are interested in, or 400 would be even better if we can. So there's quite an uncertainty. And before LHC was turned on, we only had Tavatron data and we had to extrapolate even further in energy. Now with the LHC experiments, uh, that has helped us really, really a lot. So I just show as icons here the main detectors. And uh, we do have a, a difficulty still to use the data of LHC, but we can use it. Like with LHC, of course, we measure in pseudo rapidity, and that's a typical particle distribution in pseudo rapidity. For air showers, the energy of the particle matters because a particle produces more secondary particles the higher the energy of the particle is. Therefore, the energy matters. And you see, uh, so we really start to be interested in the region of rapidity units of 5 to 10, 12, or higher. That is at the limit of what you can do or beyond the range of LHC detectors. And here you have a compilation. The interesting part is only the inner parts can really count particles. Now, if you take, for example, such a detector like CMS and you simulate and you look at the different detector elements like in this cartoon, and then you look at the longitudinal shower profile now plotted with a log scale here or exponentially and, uh, and uh, over depth, then you see that uh, essentially what you really measure very well is a tiny part of the shower, the particles. Then what you measure so and so is still or less than a tenth of the particles that are, make your shower. And if you were able to measure very well in the forward detectors, you were in the region of a tenth of the shower. So we really have to extrapolate a lot. Still, we got a lot of information from LHC, like this is a cross-section measurements from the early days here, made for example with Totem, and we have of course more cross-section measurements now from the different experiments. Then we have uh, LHCF, this is a dedicated forward experiment where you go 140 meters from the interaction point where the beam splits, and you put a detector here and you can measure neutral particles. Look how small the detector is. This is a piece of the detector here. In here you see the hands of the person. So it's actually a tiny pieces of detector that you have where most of the energy goes into because the geometry is so extreme. And then you can measure the distribution, the energy distribution of gamma ray-like particles or neutron-like particles in a very forward region. 
that we can compare to. Or this is, for example, a nice idea where you have uh, CMS and totem combined measurements and you ran for some time with a shifted vertex where you look at interactions that nominally have an interaction point outside of the nominal vertex point. And this way uh, you can have, in addition to like the central, de central detector, forward detector, you get those points with the shifted vertex. And by the way, you see Pythia uh, as a standard high energy physics Monte Carlo, but you also see A plus Q Gashtel and Sybil as a standard Cosmic Ray Monte Carlos in one plot. And that's very nice. This is made by CMS and has helped us a lot to understand what's going on. Bottom line of all this is, if you put things together, we go to our energy spectrum, that's shown here, and we have to interpret it the following way, that we have protons in this range. Then for some reason, it looks like we switch to something that is in the region of helium. You see the mass range from one to, here's proton is one, this is above one to five. Then we have to switch to something that is maybe in the nitrogen oxygen range or heavier. And then maybe we even don't see anything in the range of iron. We don't know. The bands are the uncertainty. So that this is a very conservative plot. But that's a highly non-trivial thing. And I can tell you, without LHC data, we would never ever have been able to make such a plot here. And, um, and what we also learn is that the acceleration end for protons is fairly low in energy. It's somewhere around 10 to the 18 a few times 10 to the 18. And only by going to particles to higher charge, of higher charge, we reach to the highest end. That is something we had already sort of anticipated or expected from the Hillas plot I showed you at the beginning where I showed that most sources would not be powerful enough to go to 10 to the 20 electron volts if they had to accelerate protons. And it really looks like being this. Of course, there could be a small fraction of protons here, we don't know. That's all in the region of uncertainties, but in the simplest fit, this is what it look, would look like. Okay, now if we go in this plot and say, okay, here we are in this range, this energy tends to 18.5 electron volts, we have mainly protons. Why don't we try to do physics with those protons? And of course you can do that. You can ask your showers, you can ask how often they inter the particles interact deep or very high in the atmosphere and that you can measure with those profiles, in particular how the depth of maximum shifts. And if you look at the, it's like the standard distribution with the interaction length here and the interaction length is simply the mass of the air target and, uh, and you get the cross section for proton air interactions. And if you take the cross section of proton air interactions, convert it then from the measurement with a Glauber calculation to proton proton, that is what you get. These are our points. And we can't go to really uh, the highest energies we have because we simply don't know whether we have enough protons to do it there. But at lower energy, as I showed you in this range at around 10 to 18.25 something, which you see is still considerably higher uh, than what you can reach with LHC, we can measure it. And as it turns out, we favor a conservative extrapolation. And by the way, we know also with the new measurements from LHC, a conservative extrapolation is also coming from LHC data. And most models are too high. So that's also an interesting result, but that's always repeating, history is always repeating here. Most of the extrapolations always give way too high cross sections compared to what you really have in the end. Now, if you use those profiles of showers and search for photons because they go very deep at high energy, you find that there are no photons in our data set. And if you say there are no photons, then you can do a, a, a very nice conclusion. If you had a super heavy particle decaying into pions, kaons, and whatsoever, it will produce a cascade, with, which in the end will lead to pions that will decay into photons or neutrinos and muons. And if you look at the photons there, uh, then you can, can make a limit of how often this happens. And this particle could be a super heavy particle that is dark matter. And then you get a limit. You get a limit over energy because we don't see photons, uh, how large the flux of those particles can be. And if you then take the lifetime of the particles and the mass of the particles, you get essentially a region that you can exclude 
if those particles, for example, were super heavy dark matter or, or any other object of this type. And these are very interesting limits we have. By the way, you can't do this n not as nearly as good with neutrinos, interestingly, with our limits. But you can also use anisotropy measures if it's dark matter. Then, uh, if you look for the neutrinos, so neutrinos we measure if you look for very much inclined showers that start very deep in the atmosphere. That's literally not possible for any hadronic shower because the cross-section is large and it starts early in the atmosphere. The electromagnetic part will have died out and, and, and you see only the muons from the shower. Whereas in neutrino, you can see the electromagnetic part as well and you can see it even through the mountains or you can see it coming up. Then we can make very nice limits on the neutrino flux. And it's very interesting to see, here is the ice cube limit. Here's the Auger limit. And there are regions where they are competitive with each other. In the end, ice cube is going to win because ice cube has a wider energy range to the low energy. But we are in the very interesting range of the waxman bakal benchmark is here. So we are close to seeing sources where we would expect them. And this is the plot that is shown here, the number of events we expect for different calculations that have been done in the past, predictions. And the red ones are already excluded. The yellow ones are touched. The green ones are still compatible because you expect only one or two neutrinos. And that is still statistically compatible with not seeing a neutrino for our data set. Of course, it's also very interesting uh, for gravitational wave events I will show in a minute. Okay, we can search for Lorentz invariance violation this way. And that is uh, shown here. For example, if a particle propagates, the energy loss length, this would be the standard one, is modified. If you have a modified dispersion relation, you, can, you are sensitive to it because the spectrum will change its shape. Or you can look at showers inside a shower. For example, neutral pion is very interesting because it's very short-lived. If you change the dispersion relation, it could live much longer or even much shorter. And uh, in one way, you are very sensitive to it and then you can derive limits and with various different parameters and powers. So I don't reproduce in the parameters. You can look at the recent publication by OG that by the way, uh, was uh, the lead authors are from Brazil here and uh, also at conference contributions. Now we have these spectacular showers in our data set that are going from one way to the other all the way through the array, essentially 50 kilometers long. And these are horizontal showers, muons, a bundle of muons going through the array. These are showers that are very useful because they go through a very large overburden. If you look at the atmospheric depth, the particle number, this is a shower profile for electromagnetic particles. They are essentially completely absorbed and then the muons take over. And that happens around 60, 65 degrees at this range. And of course there are still electromagnetic particles here that come from accident or from time to time immune decays. There's always a rate of immune decay. If you look at those showers, and that's very interesting, you arrive at the conclusion that we call the muon puzzle. You do see, and that's a data point of OG, in relative units, you see more muons in the showers than you would predict, independent of what you assume as a primary composition. So you measure the depths of maximum, you look at the different compositions you can have for different hadronic interaction models. Like this uh, is a QGS jet proton prediction here, you nitrogen iron, and you can look, this is a measurement for X max. So in QGS jet, it would be somewhere between proton and helium. And then you would expect this number, but we see this number of muons. So that's a real problem because we see roughly 30% more muons. So I translate this number to you, it's 30% more. And, uh, um, and it's a very interesting problem and there are a lot of publications and work on that, Oops, excuse me. But at the same time, if you look at the fluctuations, shower to shower fluctuations, how many muons we have relative to the number of muons, it looks normal. It looks like what we expect. The grayish band is what we expect. The black points is what the data points are. So that's compatible with our composition in mass, we assume, and with the um, Monte Carlos. And that measures for us, it's like a PMT analogy. The fluctuations in those showers come all from the first few interactions, like in a PMT in the first few multiplication phases for the dinodes. And that means the first few interactions, at least what the multiplicity fluctuations look like, behave like normal interactions. That's a puzzle we are still working with. 
So let me come back to the arrival direction. I, I mentioned at the beginning that we have a hope to see a correlation with sources. This is an old plot in principle, though it's from 2018. I still show it because it's a very nice one. It shows the black dots are like uh, potential sources we could have. And this is a smeared over density map of the world data at the time for the northern and southern hemisphere. And, and you see, for example, Centaurus A is a nearby uh, um, supermassive black hole, an active galactic nucleus. And, uh, and, but you see, it's very strange what we see. So we do see over densities, not very strong ones. So there are three point something sigma effects. But we see, for example, nothing from here where we would expect something or from here, maybe that's shifted. So that's, uh, that might be from here, it's not clear. We still have to work on that. So we, we can't say that's a source. That is very difficult because we first of all don't have all protons at high energy as we would like to have or, or we're hoping when we started off. So particles are deflected more and of course, uh, so physics is more complicated and we will have to work more. So what we can do is we can go to secondary particles. We can ask, if the particles are deflected, why don't we go to the secondary particles like the gamma rays or the neutrinos? First of all, the GZK mechanism, that was an energy loss mechanism, produces neutrinos. That would be something useful, but they are really high in energy and they are not the ice cube neutrinos. The ice cube neutrinos are much lower in energy. They are at the same energy density level, but not really there. And of course, they would only appear if we had protons and at the highest energies, we don't have a large fraction of protons. Okay, let's look at the neutrinos. So we do have neutrino telescopes like Antares now dismantled and uh, here ice cube at the South Pole measuring the Cherenkov light either in water or in ice of a cascade produced by neutrinos. For example, here a muon neutrino produces a, a, a interaction and then a track that you can measure. The interesting part, this is one cubic kilometer in size this was 100 at the time. That makes, of course, a difference how big you are. Now, IceCube has uh, discovered uh, high energy neutrinos already in 2013. And there is a, a very rich physics here with different configurations of different neutrinos, electron neutrinos, mu neutrinos, tau neutrinos. And you can do all sorts of things, cross sections and whatever. But I can't really talk about it because I don't have enough time for that. But you see, for example, this is, uh, is a flux derived in ice cube uh, if you like define your detector with a video around and then look for uh, like starting tracks here or things like that. So, but what I want to show you is if you look at the map of ice cube of the arrival direction distribution, because you expect of course neutrinos to point perfectly to their sources. It turns out you have a very hard time to find a source. Actually, you look at the map and there are different colors for different types of events and all this. And there's of course an acceptance region of the ice cube detector here. It turns out you don't see a source. And if you look at the map of the cosmic rays, you see these over densities at the three sigma level, but you don't see really a clear source either. And what makes everything worse, if you com correlate those arrival directions with those neutrino directions, no significant correlation is found, which recently has been submitted by this group of collaborations. So we do have a hard time to move forward, but it's not completely unexpected. If you look at neutrinos, you can look in, in the universe up to redshift basically of four at very, very large distances. The universe is essentially homogeneous. It's full with sources. Every, in every direction you have sources. If you look at cosmic rays, you can see only the nearby part at the highest energies because of the energy loss and you have anisotropy. So that would help you a lot to see the sources, but at the same time, you have the magnetic deflection that smears everything out again. Now, if you go to gamma rays, you have a limited range of uh, being able to look into the universe and you have, uh, of course, no deflection and see the anisotropies. So gamma rays is an interesting way to go. And so let's look at, uh, at uh, gamma rays from sources, not gamma rays produced from those particles really directly, but maybe in source regions or nearby through such a kind of process. And what we do is we look, for example, with 
in the imaging Cherenkov telescopes at uh, showers in the atmosphere or with the indirect measurements like air shower arrays that measure gamma rays by simply asking for showers that have no muons in it. And of course, we have satellites. And now we have sources. We have actually tons of sources, like a few thousand of sources if you take everything or if you look only at the high energy part, it's like 1,500 sources everywhere. You see the galactic disk, you see extra galactic space. The catalog today had uh, 251 sources in it in the TV range, for example, that you measure with such telescopes or here, this catalog is from Fermi. And if you go to the indirect measurements with air shower detectors, it's like Hawk in Mexico. This is a photograph. It looks like a, but it's real. And uh, it's a beautiful detector where the, with a shower, of course, uh, animated on top. And this is a very new installation. This is LASO in China, which is even larger with an enormous number of detectors in it. And this is square kilometer in size. And, and you have lots of sources. Now it turns out essentially all of those sources are in our current understanding accelerating electromagnetic particles. So electrons and positrons mainly. And very few might do protons or other hadrons. And none of them goes really to very, very high energy. And that's a real problem. So how do we move forward? And that is essentially shown here. If you, we, we, we have been a little bit lucky, but not completely yet. So in 2017, we were lucky that we had one event and that's August 17th, 2017, the gravitational wave interferometers LIGO and Virgo saw a merger of a, a neutron star pair and uh, detected the gravitational waves. The interesting part is this is a Fermi satellite. It saw the light curve and you see a clear enhancement. This is integral. So you very nicely see the signal also there. And here you see the gravitational wave chirp. This is how they spiral into each other. That increases the frequency and then the merger is here. And shortly afterwards, you see the light paths. That is something that is fantastic. And, uh, and so that's a mighty messenger observation in the sense gravitational wave and photons. Now, if you look at, for example, what we saw, like the Ogier Observatory or Ice Cube or others from this event, you can ask, have there been uh, neutrinos? Uh, and uh, here are the upper limits. This is the Ice Cube upper limit for the neutrino flux, the Antares upper limit. This is the Ogier upper limit. This is predictions from different calculations that you could ho have hoped for to see, but actually we think it's a little bit offset the direction, this, the, the, the jet direction. Therefore, we, we just literally have no chance to see really neutrinos in this case. And that Oji is on par with Ice Cube is because we were lucky. This was in a direction that was nearly horizontal. This is a perfect earth skimming direction for us at the time when this event happened, here is the location of the event. And uh, that means Oji had a very high sensitivity. By the way, this is a record-breaking publication. It's a joint publication with 70 collaborations, a few thousand authors. Okay, now that still was purely electromagnetic. The next one we saw is essentially shortly afterwards. You see it here. This is uh, September. 22nd of September 2017, there was an alert, a neutrino seen by Ice Cube, an alert sent, and then Fermi saw uh, the light, uh, the, the flare here, magic after the alert turned the telescope and saw also a signal. So we, we really actually had a, a number of uh, instruments pointing to the source and seeing something. And that's called TXS. Or five or six and whatever, this is the direction it coordinates as its standard. And uh, the interesting part is so this is a, a blazer that's a supermassive black hole having an accretion disk producing a jet that points exactly in our direction. It would hit Earth if it would uh, extend. And in this blazer, you have like what the people call knots or blobs of matter coming out, plasma. And that, that is accelerating particles. And it looks like we have got a neutrino from there and we have got the gamma rays from there. And if you go back in time further, this is what Ice Cube did. They also saw neutrinos in the past. This is one of the puzzling results. So we really don't know how to 
interpret this properly because they're, they're, it's not easy to find a conclusive model for that. But that might be the first time that we actually really waterproof, um, have waterproof evidence of a hadronic source. And it's a time coincidence half, in addition. Half, yeah? Yes. Five minutes. It's yes. Fine. fine. Okay. Uh, it's a waterproof evidence essentially of a hadronic source. Okay. Brings me to the outlook. I think we are in a golden age, or a, a golden age is to start on multi messenger astroparticle physics. We started with the first detection of uh, one of these other energy cosmic rays in 2062. Then uh, ice cubes saw neutrinos. Then LIGO started to see gravitational waves. Now we have LIGO, Virgo, and Fermi, and many other observatories working in multi messenger mode. We see it more and more. Ogier, for example, confirmed that I couldn't show here because I didn't have time the, uh, the extra galactic origin of cosmic rays at the highest energies, and it continues this way. We do know that the next observation cycle for gravitational wave instruments is going to come up here in 2023 with a much higher sensitivity than they had before and even much higher going to come. You have to scale this with volume like a factor of two in distance is a factor of eight in total number of sources. And you see here, for example, the number of sources seen with Cherenkov telescopes, ground-based telescopes over time, how it's growing. But there's much more to come. This is an upgrade of the Uji Observatory, where we put scintillators on top of the water tanks to distinguish muons from electromagnetic particles, radio antennas to do the same distinguishing process for inclined showers, because then we see only the radio parts of the electromagnetic particles, they wouldn't reach the ground. And new electronics and all this, and some muon counters, it seems to work beautifully. And of course, and I want to mention this here, we put also under a few detectors RPCs. This is a Brazil-Portuguese collaboration to count muons directly by hand. This is, for example, the first one this way to cross-check whether this method is working. And if we continue, then the next big uh, fish in the pond is telescope array that is going to, uh, Cherenkov telescope array that is going to come with this configuration right now decided this is, by the way, a prototype built or set up in Berlin with uh, this part here really uh, built in Brazil that holds the camera and uh, that will be also installed then in the south and going to Paraná. And there's a, a smaller site in the north in La Palma. And we will have zillions of sources going to come. Now we have the Southern Whitefield Gamma Ray Observatory, SWGO. This is like most likely water tanks, but that's still not fully decided. Sites have been scouted. You see data here. It would give a very nice sensitivity. This is CTA and sensitivity. This is the SWGO at higher energy with a proper field of view of the galactic center that the other instruments don't have. This is, by the way, a plot for searching for dark matter for the experts. But uh, that is what it looks like. Then we expect KM3Net to come with two installations in the Mediterranean to produce data very soon. First of those multi-PMT strings have been deployed. And IceCube is working on generation two to extend the detector from one cubic kilometer to something between six to eight cubic kilometers, including a much larger radio extension where they have already deployed some antennas in Greenland to test the whole approach. And in the long term, we will also have installations that are even much, much bigger. And this is, for example, the Grand Radio Antenna Array, where also Brazil is strongly involved in. And uh, there are ideas to have a satellite mission that really gives you, you see, much higher sensitivities. This is, for example, the Radio Array from Gen 2. This is the Grand Sensitivity. These are predictions for the neutrino fluxes. That's going to work. Brings me to this last slide. I think astroparticle physics is in a particular very exciting phase because we start to put things together. We haven't been able to use steady sources for the charged cosmic rays yet to identify them or for the neutrinos. But if we go together with the gamma rays and combine all three and possibly also with gravitational waves, it looks like we are going to uh, crack it and to solve the puzzle. And we do a lot of particle physics at the same time. 
so we can produce a lot of uh, fundamental physics and of course we depend on what uh, other accelerators produce like LHC or others to understand our data. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Let's see if you have questions after this fantastic talk. Questions? I don't see the chat, I have to say. Yeah. Let me try. Yeah. There's just a comment in the chat. Uh, congratulations for the nice talk. I also congratulate you for the nice talk. Right? So this uh, LHCF, um, it complements uh, data more specifically in uh, which of those experiments um, that are so yeah, let me try. So, um, okay, LHCF is a forward detector that is installed, co-located with ATLAS. Uh -huh. And um, it's, uh, you know, you have to go to the region where the beam pipe splits because otherwise you can't go to zero degrees, which as a drawback is, means you can measure only neutral particles. And you measure them in a tiny phase space, but because of the particles are so much beamed, you still have a fairly large coverage. One of the problems that uh, LHCF had for a long time was that the distance is so large that you can't cross trigger with ATLAS. That is what they have solved in the end, in the last run where they uh, took data. And, um, and uh, so we, we, we currently, I show you only the, what is really measured in forward direction, but there is data available where you have ATLAS and the central detector and the forward ones together except that I haven't really seen this fully. I mean, it's not published yet, so it's work in progress. And um, so it's really a dedicated uh, experiment that is mainly run by a Japanese or several Japanese groups. It's a tiny detector in principle, and it has been also taken out for, high, uh, for the higher Lumi, uh, Lumi runs. And, it, uh, and a version of it has been used at RIG for polarized beams. So it's a portable detector. So this, this is what they do. And sometimes you have like two, one photon here, one photon here. Uh, sometimes you have both photons in one detector. Um, this is how they work. So it's, but it's really a dedicated cosmic ray inspired detector. Thank you. More questions to Professor Halfinger? And the, this extension of uh, ice cube is told. Uh, yeah, let me go to the page. So the extension of ice cube is currently worked on. It's, it's uh, so in the progress that. Oop, excuse me. So the ice cube has a one cubic kilometer right now, and they are working on an upgrade, which means seven additional strings will be put into the ice to increase the density. This is for neutrino oscillation measurements and um, going lower in the threshold for this part. And that's like a precursor of the real extension that is then in size. And, uh, but right now, the seven additional strings will be deployed probably starting, I don't know, the year after the next one. And then uh, the full deployment is going to start for the big detector with, of course, a lower density of those strings compared to what you had in the original part, but still covering a large region. And in addition, you install a few better calibration devices to, to make sure that you have very good pointing. Hmm? So it's an up most of our own precision upgrade. Well, precision and size, you know, size matters because you're always low in rate. It's not like LHC where you have many events. <laughs> so we are so happy just about a few. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Tarsi. All I right. Spencer. Professor Spencer has a, has a, a question again. Go ahead, Spencer. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Very nice talk. I had a question about the composition results you showed. Um, yeah where you had rather narrow 
you know, for each species, you had rather narrow energy bands. Um, yes. And um, that is not what I've seen. What is, is there an accelerator model that leads to that? Or how hard is this to get from the accelerator perspective? So Spencer, your question is really very good because it's one of the, it goes to the heart of the puzzle. It looks like sources accelerate with a very steep spectrum and then you see the die off. It's a very hard spectrum. So a very hard spectrum. This is E cubed, of course, but E to the minus one, you probably will have at the source to go up here. And then you have this exponential cutoff and you go up here and you have an exponential cutoff. And then those protons are maybe to a large degree, secondary protons that are produced by the nuclei that disintegrate here, that disintegrate in the cosmic microwave background and in the other radiation fields in the universe. And, and that is something, therefore they are exactly appearing at this energy. But that is something that is changing our understanding of this spectrum completely. So we have a very hard time to accept it, let's say this way. But the data right now looks like it. So like an extremely hard source uh, and, uh, and not going to very high energy. So you have also a hard proton source, but it's overlaid here with uh, the disintegration protons from the side. And therefore you don't see the same pattern appearing there. And if you go back, or let me say, maybe I manage this way. Uh, if you go here, uh, you would need something like a rapidly spinning neutron star to have such a hard spectrum or, or something. I, I, we really don't know. Yeah? So um, you wouldn't have the standard Fermi acceleration what people talk about. And uh, so it's a highly non-trivial result and we are working on this for a long time already and, and we can't change it. This is what comes out from data. So it's a data driven field. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer your question? So for us, it's a puzzle. So, and, and you are rightfully asking for it because it's a, it's a strange thing. Okay. Thank, thanks. More questions? So I guess we can thank uh, Professor Halfanger for that. Uh, and I kindly ask you to upload your talk in our site. Sure, I will do so. Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks. you very much. So, Juva, maybe now we'll take care of the opening of the next two speakers' talks, right? Okay. okay thank you uh, for both speakers. Now we have uh, Professor Andrea. Andrea from uh, Northeastern University. He was going to talk to us about neutrinos. Uh, Experiment with neutrinos and oscillation. Uh, good morning, Andre. Morning, how are it's, you? Uh, so, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. So, I, I guess without delay, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, let me start doing this. Okay, so can you see my slides? Yeah, sure. And, and you can see my pointer and 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 only my title slide is half in Portuguese, uh, hopefully for the uh -huh. benefit of people who don't speak Portuguese. The rest will okay. be in English. So, okay, so uh, let me get started. My job is to tell you something about physics we can do uh, in neutrino oscillation experiments, and I'll concentrate on neutrino physics. Uh, and and I'm my job is to try to give you an overview of uh, uh, why neutrino physics is exciting and what types of questions we hope to answer uh, with neutrino oscillation experiments. There are many, many things which I won't talk about, but I'm happy to try to say something if people have questions at the end. So just to get started and to make sure that everybody's on the same page, uh, neutrino physics has been an incredibly active and very exciting topic for the last uh, 25 years or so. And the main reason for that is that we've discovered uh, neutrino flavor oscillations. So for people who have not been paying attention to this, and I presume it's uh, none of you, but I'll say this anyway, just for the sake of completeness, what we've discovered uh, during the last 25 years is that it's possible to produce a neutrino in a well-defined flavor 
let the neutrino propagate a finite distance and then measure that same neutrino in a different flavor state. And I wanna remind people that the evidence for this is absolutely overwhelming. So we have seen this uh, neutrino flavor change in muon neutrinos produced in the atmosphere. We have seen neutrino flavor change in electron neutrinos produced in the sun. We've seen this phenomenon in electron antineutrinos produced in nuclear reactors. We have seen this phenomenon in neutrinos produced in accelerators. And we've seen this phenomenon uh, uh, just about everywhere. Uh, what's also very exciting is that we only have one way of explaining all of these data, and that's to postulate that neutrino masses are not zero, that the neutrino masses are different, and that the neutrinos mix. And again, for people who have not been paying attention to this field, uh, uh, there have been a, a few Nobel Prizes associated to this, along with a, one of these uh, breakthrough prizes, which is a lot of money to lots of people. So the way in which we understand this is to postulate that the neutrinos that we learn in textbooks, which we call the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino, are really linear superpositions of neutrinos with a well-defined mass. And we call those states a nu1, nu2, and nu3. And those two different ways of defining our neutrino states are related to one another by some unitary mixing matrix. And this unitary mixing matrix, for people who are very familiar with the quark sector, is uh, the lepton analog of the CKM matrix. There's one unusual thing about neutrinos, which is uh, even though we can talk about these neutrino mass eigenstates, nu1, nu2, and nu3, we actually don't know what their masses are. It turns out when we do these oscillation experiments, we measure the differences of the masses squared. So we have to uh, uh, tell a story in order to explain who's neutrino number one who's neutrino number two and who's neutrino number three. And the story goes like this. Um, so neutrino number one has mass M1, neutrino number two has mass M2, neutrino number three has mass M3. And we define M1 squared to be less than M2 squared. That's one definition. We also define the magnitude of uh, uh, M3 squared minus M1 squared to be bigger than M2 squared minus M1 squared. We don't know, however, if M3 squared is lighter than one and two, or if it's heavier than one and two. And I'll show you a picture of this in the next slide. Of course, this is a, the three by three matrix is a unitary three by three matrix, and it's parameterized as far as oscillations are concerned in terms of three mixing angles and one CP violating phase. So here's a picture of the neutrino mass eigenstates. Uh, and again, this is supposed to represent the masses squared. And it turns out that the way in which the masses are ordered is either as in the left-hand side here or in the right-hand side here. And the picture on the left-hand side is the one where the mass of neutrino number three is uh, significantly heavier than the masses of one and two. And the picture on the right-hand side, I hope I said it right the first time, uh, is such that the mass squared of neutrino number three is a lot smaller than the mass squares of one and two. So this uh, spectrum on the left is called uh, the normal ordering or the normal neutrino mass hierarchy, because it kind of reminds us of how the charged lepton masses are ordered or how the quark masses are ordered. The plot here on the right-hand side is called the inverted ordering or the inverted mass hierarchy. And it's called inverted because it's different from the normal one. We didn't want to call it abnormal, that would be weird. Uh, so we call it inverted. By the way, uh, these pictures are pretty well known. And what's also included here is some information about the elements of the mixing matrix squared. So for example, uh, if you look at the fraction of this uh, M1 squared uh, a bar that's colored red, that's supposed to represent a uh, UE1 squared. And then the fraction of this uh, neutrino number two state, which is colored uh, green, that's supposed to represent U mu two squared and this uh, blue one uh, on the top here is supposed to represent uh, u tau three squared and so on and so forth for all the other entries. So it gives you a feel for uh, what the elements of the mixing matrix also are. So in the last uh, 25 years, we've made a ridiculous amount of progress. And uh, like I said, we have these two mass square differences. Uh, they've actually been measured at the few percent level uh, we have not established uh, if the picture looks like the left-hand side or the right-hand side. 
that's still unknown. That's the thing that's in the bottom here. We have all these mixing parameters, which again, if you like quarks, they should be thought of as the uh, analog of the uh, this magnitude of VCB or the Kabibo angle and things like that. We've also measured those angles really, really precisely, except maybe the last one, the sine square theta two, three, which we know with an error bar that's actually not very Gaussian. So if you look at it at, at the three sigma level, it's anywhere between uh, 0.4 and 0.6 for sine squared. There's a CP odd parameter that we have not measured very well, or actually we have virtually no information on that. And then, as I said, there's this neutrino mass ordering and uh, we don't really know whether it's the picture on the left-hand side in the previous slide or the picture on the right-hand side in the previous slide. I do wanna say very briefly that we do have a lot of data on neutrino oscillations and it's the combination of all of these data that allow us to measure all of these parameters very precisely. There are some data that we still don't explain very well, which is called the short phase line anomalies. And I'm not gonna be talking about that at all. So I wanna step back and give you a, a, the big picture and why people are very excited about these results. And the really big discovery, if you wanna summarize what's been going on in neutrino physics is that we have established that neutrino masses are not zero. We've also established that neutrino masses are very small. And when you say that they're very small, they're very small relative to all of the other charged fermion masses that we know about. One thing that you might know is that we've been talking about a, a, a flavor puzzle in particle physics for 50 plus years. And the flavor puzzle is, is explaining how come the, the ratio of the top quark mass to the electron mass is about five orders of magnitude. It's a big puzzle because these are all fundamental particles. Neutrino masses we know for sure are, uh, are lighter than an electron volt. And if you're very concerned about the top to electron mass ratio, the electron to neutrino mass ratio is actually about an order of magnitude larger. And to make matters more exciting, while there's a whole bunch of other fermions that live between the electron and the top quark, as far as we know, there are absolutely no particles that occupy the mass space between the electron mass and the neutrino masses. So that's kind of weird. And we think that that means something important, but independent of that, uh, we're very excited about non-zero neutrino masses because they indicate to us unambiguously that there's some new physics. Let me try to qualify a little bit what I mean by that. And I think the, the message I would like to convey is that non-zero neutrino masses require new degrees of freedom, new particles, new fields. So if you look at the standard model of particle physics, the fields that are there, uh, and, and if you stick to renormalizable interactions, they are not capable of giving the neutrinos a non-zero mass. So you need some new degree of freedom. What makes neutrino physics interesting is the fact that we don't know what those new degrees of freedom are yet because we don't have enough information. And the amount of, uh, uh, and the, the possibility space is gigantic because the new degrees of freedom can be bosons or they can be fermions. They can be very heavy new particles or they can be very light new particles. There can be charged particles or neutral particles. There can be particles that are easy to see in some particle physics experiment, or these might be new particles that are absolutely impossible to ever discover in a physics experiment. So it's kind of a big deal. So we've learned something new, but we don't really know what we've learned yet. And I like to remind people that there are a few other things that have been going on in particle physics this century, which also tell us that our understanding of particle physics is incomplete. And then there has to be a new degrees of freedom. This includes things like the dark matter puzzle, uh, the baryogenesis puzzle and the dark energy puzzle. And I like to remind people that all of these puzzles that I've just mentioned, they are related to cosmology and astrophysics in different ways. The neutrino mass puzzle was the only one that's sort of a grounded, literally in the fact that they are related to experiments that uh, we can do here on Earth, setting aside uh, neutrinos from the atmosphere and the sun. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Uh, so we all know that in particle physics, masses are hard to come by. So we need to appeal to something like the Higgs mechanism or electric symmetry breaking to explain why everybody has a mass except for the Higgs boson. And uh, 
When it comes to neutrinos, life is not too different because again, neutrino masses also come through electric symmetry breaking. But it turns out that when it comes to neutrinos, uh, you have some choices and the choices can be qualitatively different. So one uh, well-known choice is that maybe the neutrino masses are just like everybody else's mass. And maybe they just speak to the Higgs boson very, very little. So this is a scenario that some people favor. And it's a nice scenario, except that it, it renders lepton number an exact symmetry of nature, which is difficult for us to explain, especially if you're a little bit theory-minded. Another possibility for non-zero neutrino masses is that maybe there's another Higgs boson and this other Higgs boson only talks to neutrinos and the W and the Z. And that might explain why the neutrino masses look so different because maybe everybody, everybody's mass comes from the Higgs mechanism with the regular Higgs and the neutrino masses come from the Higgs mechanism but with a different Higgs boson. Then there's another possibility which is, which is maybe the neutrino mass is derived from both the electric symmetry breaking scale and some new source of mass of which we know absolutely nothing. And uh, this is, turns out to be the scenario that everybody likes if you talk to theorists. And one famous version of that's the so-called the seesaw mechanism. So there are lots of then qualitatively different choices. And this is just a subset of choices. And we need more experimental data to sort out which one of those directions happens to be correct, if any of them. In order to piece this uh, neutrino puzzle, uh, we need a lot of uh, uh, efforts which rely both on the theory side and the experimental side. And the efforts are very diverse and they come from everywhere within particle physics and astroparticle physics. So there are lots and lots of different types of particle physics probes that can inform the neutrino mass puzzle. And they range from things like a searches for neutrino less double beta decay, which is a nuclear physics kind of effort, uh, trying to measure astrophysical neutrinos like we heard about in the last talk, understanding the large properties of the universe, things like the CMB, uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, galaxy surveys. Uh, but those things can also, you know, we might also get information from the Large Hadron Collider. We might get information by, from measuring uh, charged lepton properties, including the mu on G minus two, or looking for rare processes like a mu to E conversion nuclei. And of course, we can learn a lot about neutrinos from neutrinos. So if we study neutrino properties in different ways, we might end up learning more about where neutrino masses are coming from. What's highlighted here is the thing that I wanna talk about in this talk, which is uh, we would also like to learn about neutrino masses from more and more precise oscillation experiments which is kind of what I like to say here, which is uh, if you've been following neutrino physics for a while, you should appreciate the fact that we've been looking for the effect of neutrino masses everywhere. And so far we've never seen it except for neutrino oscillation experiments. So it stands to reason that if you wanna learn more about neutrino masses, you should go to the place where you've actually seen the neutrino masses in action and hope that you're gonna learn more. And I'm not gonna talk about the experiments very much, but I wanna give you a, a, a quick reminder of where we are and where we're going with neutrino oscillation experiments. And uh, right now we have two large uh, long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments, one in the US, one in Japan, they're called the T2K and NOVA. And they have been doing lots of uh, really fun measurements of neutrino oscillations, both of the new mu disappearance type and the new E appearance type. And they've been measuring uh, uh, mixing parameters very well, and they're starting to look at whether CP is violated in the neutrino sector. Very soon, there's a new qualitatively different experiment turning on in China called the Juno experiment, which is a reactor experiment that will also make precision measurements of oscillation experiments, and hopefully will start to inform us a little bit more on this uh, neutrino mass order, even though that's probably a very difficult measurement to make. We've also heard about, you know, from IceCube in the last talk, Ice cube also gets to measure atmospheric neutrinos and there's lots of them. And that uh, they also can inform this neutrino oscillation paradigm uh, by doing precision measurements of atmospheric neutrinos. In the future, let's say uh, by the end of this decade, we hope to have two, uh, uh, you know, sort of the moral uh, uh, continuations of the T2K ANOVA experiments 
which are the hyperkamiokande experiment in Japan and the Dune experiment in the US uh, that are supposed to uh, determine for sure whether CP is violated or not in the neutrino sector and allow us to do some non-trivial measurements. And uh, we're all looking forward to that. These are difficult experiments, very large and uh, quite expensive as it turns out. So I wanna go back to this picture to remind you uh, what haven't we done yet. And uh, you know, I showed you that we can measure all of these mixing parameters very, very precisely. There's still some things that we haven't measured. I mentioned the fact that we don't know if CP invariance is violated in the neutrino sector or not. Uh, we don't know the neutrino mass ordering, so we don't know if it's the left picture or the right picture. Uh, there's another fun thing that people like to talk about, which is uh, if you stare at the picture that I drew, you will notice that on purpose, uh, all, of the, all of the little bars that I have here are such that the amount of green and blue is the same. So one question we would like to ask is, is that really true? Or concentrating on the number three state, you know, is the, three the number three state more green than blue or the other way around? And you can say, this sounds like a really stupid question, uh, but some theorists think it's not a stupid question. And if it turns out that, you know, the amount of green and blue is exactly the same, there might be some exciting symmetry reason for that. But what I always like to remind people is the fact that what we would like to do in the neutrino sector is not just to measure a whole bunch of numbers, but we really would like to make sure and convince ourselves that this picture that we've come up with, that there are three neutrinos and they have masses and they interact according to the standard model weak interactions and so on, we want to make sure that this formalism is correct. So we don't just want to measure things. In some sense, we would like to over measure things in order to test if this picture is true or not. I wanna remind people that we've done that in the quark sector. And uh, for people who don't follow quark physics, there is this plot here that hopefully you can see. And this plot here has lots of colored contours in it. Every colored contour here is a measurement and it's a measurement translated into this uh, famous rho eta plane which has to do with mixing. And in order for you to translate your measurement into the rho eta plane, you have to assume the model, which is a standard model plus quark mixing. And you notice that we've measured these same two parameters, rho and eta, in 20 different ways. And the reason we're doing this is not because we can, although we can, so that's nice. Uh, but the reason we're doing this is that if our model is correct, all of these different measurements have to meet at a point. If they don't meet at a point, they would indicate to us that our model is incomplete. In case you're wondering, uh, all of these measurements do meet at a point, which is right here. So people are kind of disappointed by that. I should also warn you that this is a 2009 plot. If you look at the 2019 plot, it looks exactly like this one. The error bars are smaller, but everybody still meets at a point. So the interesting question for us is, how do we do this in the neutrino sector or in the lepton sector? And if we go back to our picture, uh, this is more for the experts, but I do wanna remind you of the fact that even though we have this very nice looking mixing matrix and we can measure the parameters that parameterize the matrix very well, if you ask yourself, what do we really know about this matrix? What we know is this list that's, that I listed down here. And I'm not gonna go through the list, but I want you to notice two things. One is that for the most part, we measure the magnitude squared of these elements here that are in color. And we normally measure them in different experiments. So for example, uh, you know, we measure UE2 squared very well with solar neutrino experiments. And we measure U mu3 squared very well with uh, um, long baseline nu mu disappearance experiments. And we measure UE3 squared with reactor neutrino experiments. There's some measurements that measures the products of these things squared, and we have very little information on interference. So as far as establishing properties of this matrix, uh, uh, we are relatively limited. People have done quantitative studies of that. And if you ask how unitary the matrix is, uh, our ability to test uh, you know, unitarity relations you know, in the sense that 
this number here is zero or this number here is zero or that this number here, forget the one, that this number adds up to one, our ability to test that uh, ranges from uh, the several percent level to the 10 to 20 to 30% level. So we have a long way to go. I wanna give you a flavor of how good things could get. So for example, if we did something like the Dune experiment and uh, we made measurements of the uh, oscillation parameters using different oscillation channels, uh, it doesn't matter what the parameters are. Let's look at the plot here on the left. What I'm telling you is that if you make a measurement of new E appearance, so this is new mu to new E oscillations, and you measure these two oscillation parameters, you can get something like this blue contour over here. If you look at data that has to do with new mu's oscillating into anything, so new mu's disappearing, you can get something like this red contour over here. So a nice way to start checking if your model is correct is to make sure that those plots actually point to the same region of parameter space. And for example, in our simulation here, they do, and they would you know, all combine and tell you that these parameters are wherever the star is. But you see that these measurements are precise enough that if I combine these different channels, I can start to ask if they disagree with one another. So this is something very exciting that we can't do very well, but we hope to be able to do quite well once these very big new experiments coming online uh, start taking data. I do wanna point out also this uh, green region here. The green region here is how well you can measure these same parameters using tau appearance data. And you notice that tau appearance is not so hot because the error bars are gigantic, but uh, it's not too bad. And the one thing that we've discovered, for example, is that by looking for tau appearance at Dune, uh, you can do a unitarity test of uh, one of the columns of the uh, mixing matrix at the several percent level. And this is uh, at least a factor of two or three better than what we can do today. And on top of that, we can do that using data from just one experiment. We don't have to combine data from qualitatively different experiments. And I should warn you that this plot is a very busy plot. And if you try to make sense out of it, uh, you, you might get confused. That was not our intent, but that's how it worked out. So as I was mentioning, we have the ability then to check if our paradigm is correct, or if the picture that we've come up with is, is the correct picture. And you are allowed to ask yourself, so what could go wrong in neutrinos? So we're pretty sure neutrinos have mass. We're pretty sure the neutrinos interact via the weak interactions. So what could we be missing? And there's lots of things that could happen and many of them only happen because neutrino masses are not zero. So here's a, a very incomplete list of stuff that could happen. And I'm listing mostly the very boring stuff that people have thought of. So what are the possibilities? So one possibility is that there could be more neutrinos around. And if there were more neutrinos and if they all mix, then for example, this uh, three by three mixing matrix that we've been reconstructing might not be unitary. Actually, probably shouldn't be unitary because it would be a submatrix of a much bigger unitary matrix. Another possibility is that maybe neutrinos have some new interactions that we don't know about. If the neutrinos have new interactions and you don't know about them, when you reconstruct your, neutrin your neutrino data, taking only the weak interactions into account, uh, uh, you would get the wrong answer. So that means that you, know, you could discover a new neutrino interaction by finding inconsistencies uh, uh, in your measurement of mixing parameters. Another thing that's very interesting and, and very exciting is that neutrinos could have some other properties that we don't know about. They could have a non-zero magnetic moment. They could have a finite lifetime. And by the way, if you've never thought about this, because we know neutrino masses are zero are not zero, we know for a fact that the neutrinos must have a magnetic moment. We also know for a fact, by the way, that the heavier neutrinos must decay. That's just because that's how physics works. But we also know that within the standard model, the neutrino magnetic moments are expected to be ridiculously small. And we also know from the standard model that the neutrino lifetimes are also expected to be ridiculously long, like 10 to the 40 years. But if we found evidence for a non-zero neutrino magnetic moment, 
or a non-zero or non-zero neutrino lifetime, uh, that would be evidence that there's more new physics out there. One thing which I'm not going to talk about very much is, of course, neutrino oscillations are an interesting phenomenon onto themselves. So they can they allow us to test things like a CPT invariance. They allow us to test whether our understanding of the time evolution of quantum states is correct and all kinds of other weird stuff. And of course, there's more stuff that I'm not going to talk about. So let me give you some examples of how our measurements uh, or, and, and the fact that we're going to be measuring neutrino oscillations precisely opens a window for uh, asking interesting questions. So one question we can ask, for example, is uh, are the neutrino masses and the anti-neutrino masses the same? Or are they different? And we know the answer is they have to be the same because of the CPT theorem. A similar question we can ask is, are the neutrino mixing angles the same as the anti-neutrino mixing angles? And again, this is a more roundabout question, but the answer is also yes because of the CPT theorem. So the pragmatic question is, if I measure the oscillation of neutrinos and the oscillation of anti-neutrinos separately, uh, can I measure those parameters precisely enough in such a way that I can test if they're the same. Of course, I'm not saying that we should be looking for a uh, um, CPT violation of this type and that I have a model for that, but it's interesting to compare these measurements, ask if they agree, and in case they don't agree, that will probably allow you to understand something at a level that we don't understand things very well. So it's a good test of the formulas. So we did some work on this a few years ago, and here's sort of a, a, another busy plot. Uh, let's concentrate on the one on the top, for example, just for the sake of argument. Uh, this is a combination of the Dune and the Hyper-K experiments. And uh, the red region is how you measure these parameters here, sine squared theta 2, 3, and sine squared theta 1, 3, assuming using only neutrino data. You actually get these two degenerate regions, the red ones. If you only use anti-neutrino uh, parameters, you get this blue region. And uh, if you don't include uh, other experiments than Dune and Hyper-K, you get this dashed regions over here. So the first thing that's fun to appreciate is the fact that the neutrino data by themselves and the anti-neutrino data by themselves are not super precise, but it's when you combine the two, which is this black region over here, that, that you get these super precise measurements. That's one comment. The other comment is that there is room within the precision of these measurements for these different measurements to disagree with one another. Of course, in our simulation, we assume that they agree, but if they didn't agree, you would see that those uh, uh, red regions and blue regions would not overlap once you do these uh, experimental measurements. This is kind of what we do over here. So on the stop plot here, we're plotting the, the, re the measurement of theta 1, 3 using anti-neutrinos versus a measurement of theta 1, 3 using neutrinos. And uh, we simulate a data where those two numbers are different from one another. And you see that by combining different types of experiments, we could be in a world where we can convince ourselves that those two numbers are not the same. So the, the place when they're the same is this uh, diagonal line. So you see that in this simulation here, we get a very robust evidence that the neutrino mixing angles and the anti-neutrino mixing angles appear to be different. This is kind of exciting if we were in a world where this happened. But again, the goal here is to demonstrate uh, precision. Let me briefly talk about a different scenario, which is uh, what happens if we postulate that there are more neutrinos. So if you postulate that there are more neutrinos, let's talk about the neutrinos with a well-defined mass, then my mixing matrix is much bigger. So it's not three by three, but it's four by four, or maybe five by five, and so on. It's easy to define the neutrinos with a well-defined mass, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. It's more fun to think about what are these new flavor states that I'm coming up with on the left-hand side. And uh, we don't know what those are. We know that they don't participate in the weak interactions very much. So we like to call them sterile neutrinos, but it's not very important. What we're usually very sensitive to is whether they're new neutrino mass states, because new neutrino mass states come along, if they're very light, they come along with some new oscillation frequencies and uh, we can be sensitive to those. I'm not going to talk about this very much, but again, if you do have more neutrino states, then your mixing matrix is parameterized with more phases and more mixing angles. So we have a whole bunch of new parameters that we can try to measure. 
And there's one thing that the neutrino community gets excited about, which is that if you have more neutrino mass states, you also have more sources of CP violation that you can probe and learn from. So here's an example of what the data could look like. So this is a, a appearance data at some experiment like Dune on the top, uh, disappearance data in an experiment like Dune on the bottom, and uh, the standard scenario are the black curves, and uh, we've introduced a fourth neutrino state, and the data would be consistent with the blue curve uh, if you did have a fourth neutrino state. And this is just to show that we are sensitive to this new neutrino state. And one thing that's fun about this particular one that we came up with is uh, that it introduces a new frequency in your spectrum. So you can see more oscillations than you expected if you have more neutrino states. So that's just to give you a, a sort of a feel of how we could find these new neutrino states out there. These are some very busy plots that just show you the sensitivity of next generation experiments. For the experts in the audience, don't look at anything above 10 to minus one EV squared because uh, we made some simplifying assumptions that make these plots not particularly realistic. And I should also warn you that these plots are kind of old. So the, the Minos line in particular has shifted a little bit towards the left. And one thing that we also did is we picked some scenario and we discovered that if you had something like the Dune experiment, you have the ability to not only discover CP violation, but to convince yourself that there's more than one source of CP violation in the lepton sector. That of course would be very exciting. And uh, we probably chose something that's very optimistic, but it gives you a sense of the fact that these new experiments that are coming online can do more than just measure the mixing parameters that we know about, but they are sensitive to new phenomena and, and they can explore the parameter space of these new phenomena. I'm gonna skip the slide over here. And I just wanna say that again, if you like tau neutrinos, which I do, uh, then uh, if you use tau neutrino data, uh, you can explore parts of this uh, fourth neutrino parameter space uh, that, that are hard to explore if you don't have information from tau appearance. So I wanna shift gears and uh, talk about something else. So again, uh, what I've been trying to say is that doing more neutrino oscillation experiments is a great way of testing whether our ideas are correct or not. I now wanna concentrate on the opposite scenario, which is let's assume that our ideas are actually correct, that there are three neutrinos, that they all interact via the standard model. You're allowed to ask, why am I, you know, how much am I gonna learn by measuring these neutrino oscillation phases and mixing angles and mass square differences more precisely. One thing I like to remind people of is uh, neutrino experiments allow you to look for CP violation. Let me remind you about CP violation in the standard model. So first of all, CP can be violated in the standard model. That's what people figured out in the 60s and the 70s. And without neutrino masses, the number of CP violating parameters in our theory is actually two. One of those is a phase in the CKM matrix. We've actually measured that phase pretty well. And it's a phase, it's some angle, and it's about 70 degrees or something, which I always forget. It's a large number. We don't know why it has that value, but that's, that's what experiment tells us. There's another mixing parameter that we don't like to talk about very much which is the theta term uh, in the QCD Lagrangian. So it's this uh, GG dual kind of coupling. We don't know what that value is. We don't know what the theta term is. We know it's ridiculously small. It's like 10 to minus 11. Again, it's not something we understand, but we have lots of theoretical ideas that could explain why that number is either very small or zero. So that's what we knew about CP violation before neutrino masses. With neutrino masses, we know that there's at least one more mixing parameter or one more parameter that can violate CP, which is this phase in the neutrino mixing matrix. And if the neutrinos are Majorana fermions, it turns out that there's actually more, two more CP violating parameters as well that, li that live in the neutrino sector. Now, why is that exciting? You know, if nothing else, the number of CP violating parameters grew from two to at least three or maybe five. And if the number is five, then it turns out that most of CP violation 
that exists in nature lives in the lepton sector. And we know absolutely nothing about that. So our knowledge of CP violation for what it's worth is bound to increase by at least 50% within the next data. It's not very often that our knowledge of anything increases by 50%. Another thing which I like to warn people, of course, is that if you ask around what the neutrino CP violating phase should be, people like to say that it's probably some large angle, like uh, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 65 degrees. But I do want to, want to remind you of the fact that we know absolutely nothing about CP violation. We don't know if nature likes to violate CP by having large parameters. We don't know if nature doesn't like to violate CP and maybe the phase in the CKM sector is an aberration. So trying to guess what the answer will be in the lepton sector almost never works. And I like to remind people that if you're old enough, you might remember those times when your theory friends were telling you that even if the neutrinos did have mass, the mixing angles are probably gonna be super small and very hard to measure. And it turns out that that was completely wrong. The neutrino mixing angles are super large and they turn out to be relatively easy to measure if you made the right experiment. Of course, people like to talk about CP violation for lots of reasons. One reason is of course that we know that CP violation is probably a necessary requirement for explaining why the universe has more matter than antimatter. So that's kind of a big deal. And even though we can't establish a direct connection between CP violation in the neutrino sector and uh, the, the, left, the baryon asymmetry of the universe, there are models that know how to do that. And on top of that, we know that more sources of CP violation are needed. So we're, we're gonna learn a lot about CP violation from the neutrinos. We don't know what we're gonna do with that information, but we'll get there when we get there. So the last topic I wanna to say a few things about and then I'll, I'll conclude is, uh, again, why do we wanna measure neutrino mixing parameters very precisely? And one thing that is the subject of a lot of uh, theoretical work is, is asking very dangerous uh, why questions. And we're very familiar with the quark mixing matrix, which looks like this. These are the magnitudes of the entries of the quark matrix. And you notice how weird this matrix looks because it's mostly a diagonal matrix with some small elements in the off diagonals and the off diagonal elements are hierarchical. So we like to believe that this matrix is nature's way of trying to tell us something. The neutrino mixing matrix looks like this. And the key point is that this matrix here on the left is super different from the matrix, matrix on the right. So we wanna understand why these matrices are very different. And on a good day, we also like to understand why the entries of this matrix have the values that they have. By the way, I am of the, I, I like to believe that this matrix here on the left is kind of a generic looking matrix and it may not have an explanation while the matrix here on the right is the one that does look very weird and it probably has some underlying explanation associated to it. But of course, so we don't do science on a hunch, but the question is, is it possible that by measuring neutrino mixing parameters more precisely, we're gonna learn more about the physics that might lie beneath and, and explains uh, the values that we observe? The answer is, of course, we don't know, but we can talk to our theory friends. So for example, this here is a compilation of different models. And these are different models that make a prediction for the CP violating phase delta. The prediction is not a sharp number, but it's given to us in the form of a probability distribution. So for example, in this uh, green model over here, cosine of delta is expected to be around 0.6 with some uncertainty that's about 0.1. And in this uh, blue model, cosine of delta is expected to be like minus 0.3 with some error bar, which is also about 0.1. So if you believe this way of understanding physics, uh, this kind of gives you some guidance about how well you'd like to measure cosine of delta because you'd like to measure it well enough that your error bar allows you to distinguish these different colored curves from one another. And that might be one way of making progress. You know, so if you ask yourself, I'm in the business of measuring cosine of delta, how well do you need it to be measured? Uh, the answer can come from some guidance from theory. 
Another way in which theory likes to make uh, uh, predictions is that if you believe that there's some underlying physics behind the values of the neutrino masses and the mixing angles, what this usually means is that even though you have all of these parameters, they're not independent, which means that there's gonna be some function of all of your parameters that's equal to zero. So this is telling you that your mixing angles are not independent from one another, but they obey what we call some sum rule. So there's a lot of models that look like that. There are other kinds of models that like to relate the, mi the mixing matrix in the lepton sector with the mixing matrix in the quark sector. So again, those would translate into a relationship that kind of looks like this. You know, Some function of the neutrino parameters is equal to some function of the quark parameters. So again, if you're in the business of testing these relations, you can ask yourself, how do I get to test these relations better? And for example, if you wanna test a relation that kind of looks like that, what you really wanna make sure is that you can measure all of these different parameters with, with the same kind of precision. So that would tell you that we clearly need to know what delta is because if we don't know delta, it might be impossible to test a relation like that. But it also tells you that this one mixing angle that we don't know very well, we would probably profit from measuring that mixing angle better. On the other hand, uh, if you believe that the mixing matrix in the quark sector and the mixing matrix in the neutrino sector are related to one another, then you probably wanna measure neutrino mixing parameters as well as you measure quark mixing parameters. So far, we're not doing super poorly, so this is the equivalent of the mixing parameters in the quark sector. And you notice that, you know, theta one two is the Kabibo angle that we know ridiculously well. Uh, theta one three has something to do with uh, uh, VUB, which we don't know as precisely, but this is at the level with which we know the neutrino mixing angles. This is also at the level, uh, this is more like VCB. This is at the level of how well we know uh, the neutrino mixing angles as well. And here's the CP violating phase, which is really of order 70. So I remembered it, right? And it has an error bar of about five degrees. So that tells you that if you wanna start comparing the quark sector to the neutrino sector, you probably wanna start thinking about how to measure the CP violation in the, in the lepton sector at the five degree level or so. So the last thing I wanna say is to give you an example of how to do any of those things and, and how you can use them to test models. And I think I have a couple of minutes and I'm not keeping track of time. So I'll pretend that that's true. Okay, so uh, what's, what's plotted here is uh, two parameters and, uh, and predictions from two models. So one model tells you that those two parameters have to live in this uh, blue parabola here. So this is a model that makes a prediction that kind of looks like that. Another model tells you that, whoops, tells you that those mixing parameters have to be inside of this uh, red region over here, okay? So you will notice that the model that tells you that the parameters have to be inside of the red region is a really crappy model. This is the model that we were talking about in this old paper here. But what's fun about this model that tells you that the parameters have to live within this red region is that this is a model that tells you that there's no model. It tells you that these mixing parameters are just some random numbers. What's depicted here in green is a cartoon of our current understanding of the mixing parameters. And you notice that our current understanding is very consistent with the blue band, but it's also of course inside of this gigantic region that's bounded by the uh, red curve. So if you wanna test that this model is definitely a better fit to the data than this uh, so-called anarchy model, which is the non-model model, then you probably need to shrink these error bars to about the size of the blue band. And if you shrunk this to the size of the blue band and you agreed with the blue parabola, then you would probably start to convince yourself that maybe this model uh, uh, is more useful and more predictive than the model where there's no model. Uh, but we're not there yet because we're not measuring things at a level of precision such that we can start to say, that our model is making a non-trivial prediction as opposed to or compared to a model that assumes that everything is just random numbers. So we still have a long way to go. And one way to get there is to measure things more precisely. Okay, so let me conclude. 
And uh, this is my concluding slide. And the messages I wanna leave you with are that we've discovered something new in the neutrino sector, neutrino masses. And we still know very, very little about that physics that lives inside of the neutrino sector. What we do know is that neutrino masses are very small. We don't know what that means, but we think it means something important. We also know that the neutrino mixing matrix is very different from the quark mixing matrix. We also don't know why, but we also think it means something important. The main message here, which hopefully falls within the theme of this uh, session, is that we need more experimental input. So in order to make progress in understanding where neutrino masses come from, we need better, more precise data from everywhere. Nuclear physics, collider physics, neutrino physics, uh, uh, cosmology, astrophysics. I talked mostly about precision measurements of neutrino oscillations because they're sensitive to lots of different phenomena. Uh, so they will provide us with a lot of information and they are sensitive to new neutrino interactions, new neutrino states, and a whole bunch of things which I didn't have time to talk about. The last thing I wanna remind people of, especially if you've heard about neutrino oscillations before and you're an expert in it, is that you should be impressed by the fact that neutrino oscillations can see neutrino masses. And I always like to impress that on people because neutrino masses are really small. We've been looking for kinematical effects of a neutrino mass since uh, Fermi. You know, so Fermi's famous paper on beta decay is from the 1930s. And we've never seen the kinematical effect of a non-zero neutrino mass because the neutrino masses are so small. The only exception is neutrino oscillations. And the reason we can see the neutrino masses in neutrino oscillations is because of quantum interference. So as we know, doing measurements of quantum interference allow you information to, uh, uh, you know, in information that's very, very hard to gather otherwise. And that's the only reason why we can see these neutrino masses because they, are, they show up in a phase. And if we're patient and if we let the neutrino propagate long enough, meaning if we can wait a long enough time, the phase accumulates and the interference reveals to you that the neutrino masses are not zero. So basically, you know, turning the picture around, neutrino oscillations are a, a very precise quantum interference device. And it is possible that by measuring this uh, quantum interference more precisely, we can run into some more unexpected phenomena. So I will stop here, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for a very enlightening talk. Uh, I want to open the floor to questions. Uh, anybody? Well, I'll start with my question. Uh, actually, it's just a naive question because uh, I was I was look at this uh, plot of the, the you know normal versus uh, inverted hierarchy hierarchy, and uh, I was uh, no. Put the, uh, the the M1 smaller than M2. It, it, can it go the other way around? I mean, M2 is the lightest neutrino. Could it be? Yeah. This is a very good question. And uh, and the the boring answer is that this is a definition. So so right. we define M2 to be heavier than M1. Now there's still a physics question. And the physics question is: there's a different way of defining M1, M2, and M3 which you can also see in this picture, which is if you look here, M1 has the biggest amount of red, M2 has the second biggest and M3 has the least amount of red. So if you want, M1 is the one that's most aligned with the electron neutrino. So the question is how come we know that, uh, that the state that has the second most amount of red is this one? And the reason is because of solar neutrinos. So solar neutrinos can tell that M1 has more electron in it than M2. And this is a big deal because this is the same thing we would like to do in order to determine if the mass ordering looks like this or looks like that. Because you notice that in this picture, if you couldn't distinguish M1 and M2, if, you, if they fused into one state, you notice that in the normal ordering, the electron neutrino is mostly in the light states. And in the inverted ordering, the electron neutrino is mostly in the heavy states. And, and matter effects in neutrino oscillations, because the earth is made out of electrons, they can tell if the picture is the left one or the one on the right. And that's how the NOVA experiment works. 
and solar neutrinos do the same. The solar neutrinos can tell if, the, if M1 has more electron than M2 or the other way around. So yeah, so this is a, there is a lot of physics here and, and we've already made some progress such that the number of pictures that we have to draw is already a limited number. We've ruled out the other pictures. Yes, uh, I have another question, Patricia Camargo. Patricia. Hi, uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, my question was exactly on this, uh, this picture. I think you half answered it. So I was puzzled about how can we make sure to pin down the amount of red, green, and blue? And then so, because I get very, very puzzled about this, like, and as I understood, it's connected to the solar neutrino. Right, so, so, yeah. so we do have information that's already included here from the, especially the solar neutrinos, they are the ones who tell us that this is smaller than that. Uh, and then for the other parameters, we measure them in lots of different ways. How did this happen? Sorry, and uh, and we're working on getting the precision of this uh, to to be much much higher. Because I thought this was an oscillation experiment, so you target just after, let's say, uh, the detector, or and then you see by far away that it changed the flavor. So you know, yeah, I that's right. And and the solar neutrino experiments are like that. You know, the sun is very far away. And, uh, and the neutrinos are produced there and then we measure them here. And uh, we do get some, some flavor information uh, because of the way in which we can measure the neutrinos. So for example, there's something called the snow experiment and they were able to measure the solar neutrinos using both a charge current interaction that only measures electron neutrinos, but they also use the neutral current interaction that measures the sums of all the three of them. And they were the ones who managed to establish that even though the sun only knows how to produce uh, electron neutrinos, by the time you measure them on the earth, uh, you actually get both electron neutrinos and the other states. And there's one last thing for the experts in the audience, which is uh, the way in which the, the flavor of the neutrinos produced in the sun evolves doesn't really look like an oscillation because of the matter effects. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's still, and we would call that a, an oscillation by abusing the language, but there's a lot of flavor change that happens. It's proportional to masses and mixing angles, and uh, it allows us to construct this picture. But what you're saying is also correct. For some of the other measurements that we've made, like the measurement of this number here, that's a real oscillation experiment where we see a curve that does oscillate up and down as you change the distance. We like to change the energy because it's easier. So as you change the energy, you do get an oscillation. And by measuring the frequency of the oscillation, we measure the difference of the masses squared. And by measuring the amplitude of the oscillation, we measure the mixing angle. So all these things are measured in different ways and they all use uh, neutrino oscillations in different guises. So there are different ways in which oscillations manifest themselves, but all the experiments are the same. You produce neutrinos somewhere, you know what the flavors are, you measure them somewhere else and you hopefully measure some of the flavors and then you compare and then you fit that to some variation of some uh, uh, oscillatory curve. I hope that helps answer the question. Yeah, well, super, super, thanks a lot. Very, very clear, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Constantina, do you have a question? Uh, your, your mic is, is closed, your microphone's closed. Oh. No, I have no question. I was just uh, waiting for. Okay. <laughs> no, I saw, I saw you, you, your camera on, so I thought you were going to. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I, I don't see any other question. Uh, so thanks a lot, Andre, for the very enlightening talk. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, don't forget to send uh, the, your, uh, your talk uh, for your first to put on the, on the website. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. So I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we have uh, Professor Constantino Tsalis. Professor Constantino is a uh, emeritus professor at uh, CVPF, and he he's uh, you know he's one of the pioneers in non-extensive statistics, and he's going to talk us 
about the, the non-adaptive entropies and, and the relation for that with the high energy uh, physics. Okay. Um, você está vendo Givan aí? Tá, tá vendo. Tá vendo. Até full screen. Né? Uh, view, uh, view. Sim. Aí, full screen. screen. Certo, tudo bem. Okay. Então, é, eu achava que era em português, mas é, em que língua eu falo? <risos> Bom, deixa eu ver, ainda temos... A gente, tem, a gente tinha dois, dois convidados aí, deixa eu ver se ainda estão aí. É, cadê o... É o Rafa Engel, é, é. Okay. Bom, eu posso falar em português porque os slides estão em inglês. E se houver yeah. pergunta well, em inglês... I mean, you could speak Portuguese, no problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I That's fine. Problem. Okay, no problem. Bye. No problem, yeah. Pode falar com você. Ok. É porque ontem todo mundo estava falando português, aí eu não sabia. Tudo bem. Então, antes de mais nada, eu gostaria de agradecer a Gilvan e aos organizadores desta reunião do, da Renafai. É, por abrir um espaço para eu contar umas coisas que eu acho que é interessante e, e, e que apareceu recentemente. Bom, então, eu gostaria de começar com uma frase, é, com um parágrafo de Fermi. A ver, deixa eu ver um pouquinho aqui. Isso. É, de 1936, onde Fermi escreveu no seu livro Termodinâmica, a entropia de um sistema composto de várias partes é, muito frequentemente, igual à soma das entropias de todas as partes. Ele diz frequentemente, significa que ele tem na cabeça contra-exemplos, tem algum motivo pelo qual ele não diz sempre, mas frequentemente. E ele menciona aqui que estas condições não são muito óbvias e que, em alguns casos, podem não ser satisfeitas. É justamente nesta situação que eu vou é, é, colocar essa palestra, essa, essa, essa apresentação. E então ele diz que, quando estas condições não são satisfeitas, podem ter um papel considerável. Então, não sei por que aqui. Certo. Então, comecemos com esta tabela aqui de entropias. Nesta linha aqui, vocês têm a entropia de Boltzmann, Gibbs, Shannon, von Neumann, todas elas são essencialmente a mesma forma funcional. Aqui tem a forma é, genérica, menos soma de P logaritmo de P, onde P são as probabilidades, e quando todas estas probabilidades são iguais, aparece a famosa fórmula que está no túmulo de Boltzmann, em Viena. Mas eu vou falar sobretudo desta linha, onde vocês observam tem um índice a mais, que é a letra Q, e quando nesta linha vocês pegam Q tendendo para 1, vocês recuperam nesta linha como caso particular. Então, esta fórmula contém esta, esta e esta como casos particulares. Esta expressão generalizada tem muitas coisas em comum com esta, que eu não vou analisar, mas é bom frisar que tem uma propriedade importante que não compartilham, que não compartilham. Esta é aditiva e esta não é aditiva. E já vou voltar sobre esse termo. Convém introduzir esta função aqui, Q logaritmo de X, definida dessa maneira, e se vocês pegam Q tendendo para 1, recuperam no logaritmo tradicional. A sua função inversa é a Q exponencial, que aparece o tempo todo nesta teoria, e se vocês pegam Q igual a 1, ou tendendo para 1, vocês recuperam na exponencial é, corriqueira. Nesta variável, a tabela que acabo de mostrar pode ser escrita desta maneira, que é mais compacta, mais elegante e que vai facilitar muitas coisas na escritura 
das, das diversas teorias, expressões que aparecem nesta teoria. Vocês veem que aparece log, log, que log, que log. E um matemático disse numa ocasião que é well represented, half solved. Então, convém utilizar esse tipo de formas funcionais, porque elas ajudam tremendamente. Bom, a palavra aditivo. Então, aqui está a definição de aditivity, introduzida, entre outros, por Penrose, no seu livro, em 1970. Então, uma entropia é dita aditiva se para duas probabilidades, duas, dois sistemas A e B, probabilisticamente independentes, a entropia da soma é igual à soma das entropias. Caso contrário, a entropia é não aditiva. A entropia esse que eu mencionei na tabela anterior satisfaz esta igualdade e, portanto, salvo quando Q é igual a 1, ela é não aditiva. Observem também que quando cancelamos é, K em todas as partes, sobra aqui uma parte que não cancela, portanto, 1 menos Q tendendo para zero é, em vários aspectos, equivalente a K tendendo para infinito. Extensividade é uma outra definição é, que é frequentemente confundida com a aditividade, porque ambas têm a ver com a soma. Mas extensividade é uma propriedade muito mais complexa do que a aditividade. Então, um sistema é dito extensivo, uma entropia é dita extensiva, quando ela é proporcional ao número de constituintes ou proporcional ao número de graus de liberdade. Vamos ver aqui, com exemplos, a grande diferença entre aditividade e extensividade. Então, vamos considerar quatro classes. Uma, duas, três, quatro. Esta é a mais corriqueira, a mais simples. Se você joga N moedas no ar, você tem dois potência N possibilidades, que é W. Então, em geral, se você tem que o número total de possibilidades de N moedas, perdão, de N variáveis aleatórias crescer exponencialmente com N, convém utilizar a entropia de Boltzmann, porque no caso de probabilidades iguais é o logaritmo de W e o logaritmo desta expressão é proporcional a N. Portanto, a entropia é extensiva e, portanto, ela satisfaz a estrutura de Legendre da termodinâmica. Mas, na natureza, existe uma quantidade enorme de sistemas é, que não são assim. Por exemplo, esta é uma forma típica que aparece o tempo todo. Em vez de o número total de possibilidades crescer exponencialmente com N, ele cresce como uma potência de N. Neste caso, não convém utilizar a fórmula de Boltzmann, porque o logaritmo disso vai ser proporcional ao logaritmo de N. E nós não queremos logaritmo de N, nós queremos N. Tremenda diferença. Mas se vocês pegam nesse Q, para Q é igual a 1 menos 1 dividido por Rho, o mesmo Rho que está aqui, esta é extensiva. Então, essa está ok, pois satisfaz termodinâmica. Mas pode ter outras formas, pode ter esta, que é uma stretched exponential. Se a família que estamos considerando é desta, na, desta maneira, não existe nenhum valor de Q que, que possa fornecer uma entropia extensiva. E então convém utilizar outra família entrópica que existe na literatura, é chamada frequentemente S delta, e quando vocês pegam delta igual a 1 dividido por gama, o mesmo gama que está aqui, ela é extensiva e está ok. Finalmente, um outro, um último caso típico é você ter, é você ter a, a, o número de possibilidades proporcional ao logaritmo de N. Neste caso, nenhuma das anteriores resolve o problema, mas podemos usar uma entropia é, introduzida por Evaldo Curado e nesta, neste caso conseguimos também a extensividade. Estes resultados estão é, resumidos nesta tabela. Vocês têm aqui a entropia de Boltzmann-Gibbs, que é aditiva, vocês têm esse Q, esse delta e essa outra, que são não aditivas. Tudo bem. Agora, 
Vocês podem ter um sistema que pertença a esta família. Neste caso, vocês têm que utilizar a entropia de Boltzmann Gibbs, porque é ela que é extensiva. E não tem que utilizar esse Q, esse delta ou qualquer outro. Se vocês têm esta família, não tem que utilizar a de Boltzmann Gibbs, tem que utilizar a esse Q. Se vocês têm esta família, tem que utilizar a esse delta ou alguma análoga. Se vocês têm isto, tem que utilizar a entropia de curado ou alguma análoga. Em poucas palavras, se vocês casaram com Boltzmann, vocês vão permanecer nesta coluna até que a morte os separe. Mas eu estou argumentando para vocês que existe um casamento melhor, que é casar com Clausius ou casar com a termodinâmica, ou casar com a estrutura de Legendre da termodinâmica. E então você fica nesta linha até que a morte o separe. Muito bem. Esse índice aqui é difícil de calcular. É um índice que vem de primeiros princípios da dinâmica do sistema, se é um sistema conservativo, do Hamiltoniano do sistema, mas o sistema pode ser dissipativo. Mas, em alguns casos, tem sido possível calcular analiticamente que... Então, estou mostrando aqui um desses exemplos, já tem uma certa idade, e foi calculado por Filippo Caruso, que na época era estudante na Escola Normal Superior, Superior de Pisa. E então, para esse sistema, que é um sistema unidimensional, e que tem uma transição de fase de segunda ordem a temperatura zero, significa um fenômeno crítico quântico, é possível calcular analiticamente que em função da carga central que aparece em teoria quântica de campos. Esse C aqui não é a velocidade da luz, é a carga central. E aqui está esta pequena fórmula representada na variável 1 dividido por C. Vocês vemos aqui é, uma linda linha que contém Q igual a 1, quer dizer, Boltzmann Gibbs, como caso particular, o que está mostrando claramente que esta teoria não... Oh. É. Alô? Oi, Aparecida, como é que está? Está tudo bem? Peraí, o seu microfone está aberto. Já fez tudo? Fez as compras? Fez tudo? Na feirinha do... Não, não. O Gilvão, é uma pergunta para mim? Não, 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 não é o Herami esqueceu o microfone dele aberto. Deixa eu, deixa eu... Então está então tá tudo certo? Quem de liga aí? Eu não tenho... Eu vou hoje chegar às 7h20... O Sérgio vai me buscar no aeroporto. Ah, ele esqueceu. esqueceu. Bom, então temos aqui uma expressão analítica que contém como caso particular Q igual a 1. E para outros valores, temos outros valores de Q, Ising, modelo XY, outros aqui. Muito bem. Aqui o cálculo foi feito de primeiros princípios porque ele... É, é, é implicado pela forma do Hamiltoniano, mais exatamente pela classe de universalidade, pela simetria do Hamiltoniano. Então, é um cálculo de primeiros princípios que raramente consegue se fazer, mas, neste caso, foi possível. E aqui está o resultado. Um outro ingrediente importante nesta teoria é a que generalização do teorema do limite central é, e também da que, da que generalização do teorema de Levignedienko, e nestes trabalhos participou ativamente Murray Gell-Mann, que lamentavelmente nos deixou uns dois anos atrás. Então, esses dois teoremas são complexos para explicar rapidamente, mas estão é, resumidos nesta tabela. Quando o Q é igual a 1, quer dizer, você está somando variáveis aleatórias independentes ou quase independentes, se a variância é finita, o atrator é gaussiano. Esse é o famoso teorema do limite central em teoria de probabilidade. Se a variância diverge e algumas delicatessas matemáticas, o atrator não é mais uma gaussiana, passa a ser uma distribuição de Levy. Mas o caso que eu estou discutindo são essa coluna quando o Q é diferente de 1. Significa que temos fortes correlações globais entre as N variáveis aleatórias que estamos somando. 
Y en este caso, si esto es finito, los atractores son que gaussiana, están directamente relacionados con las que exponenciales que yo mencioné antes, y si ellas divergen son Q alpha stable distributions, es aquí. Mas a que va a me interesar sobre todo es este caso, es esta aquí, pues aparece frecuentemente en la naturaleza y pensamos que eh, aparece eh, frecuentemente en la naturaleza precisamente porque en circunstancias bastante genéricas, o atrator deja de ser una gaussiana o una distribución de Levy y pasa a ser una que gaussiana. Eh, eu vou mostrar para vocês um exemplo eh, de plasma. Eh, em princípio, não precisa ser um plasma eh, de alta energia, pode ser basicamente qualquer plasma. Um trabalho de Fernando Nobre, Evaldo Curado e a orientanda deles, Gabriela. Então, eles consideraram aqui uma esfera eh, tridimensional eh, que tem uma carga superficial de mais que maiúscula, uma externa bastante distante que tem carga menos que, menos que maiúscula, e tem aqui muitas pequenas cargas negativas, que, portanto, tendem a colar com esta, carga, com esta região central, cuja carga é pequena que é zero. Bom, é, se o sistema é fortemente amortecido, ou verdão, a distribuição em função da distância é esta curva preta e não esta curva azul. Esta curva azul é o que em química é chamada é, função de Debye-Hückel e em física nuclear é chamada função de Yukawa. 1 sobre R vezes a exponencial, com Q igual a 1, fica esta azul. Mas esse sistema não gosta da lei de Debye-Hückel ou de Yukawa. Gosta desta Q exponencial, que está em vermelho aqui, e cujo valor de Q é 1,35, quem sabe o valor analítico seja 4 terços, mas não, eles não conseguiram calcular o valor analítico deste Q. Então, aqui vocês têm um exemplo onde um sistema relativamente simples mas com interações de longo alcance, pois está cheio de interações colombianas aqui, é, não gosta da mecânica estatística de boltzmann gibbs Não gosta de que igual, gosta de que diferente. Agora, vamos nos aproximar à é, física de altas energias. Aqui vocês têm, em log log, a distribuição de probabilidades de ter numa colisão próton-próton, ter momentos transversais que saem é, PT. Então, aqui estão representados em pontos os resultados experimentais é, de CMS, de Atlas, de Alice, e tem na literatura centenas de coisas deste tipo, mas este é particularmente é, chamativo porque tem aqui nada menos do que 14 décadas, 14 décadas num único experimento, é, com um único equipamento. Então, é uma coisa é, excepcional e muito valiosa. Então, o que tem para observar aqui, em primeiro lugar, o talento dos experimentais que conseguem fazer um experimento passeando por 14 décadas de um golpe só, por assim dizer. A segunda coisa que chama muito a atenção são estas linhas cheias que fitam perfeitamente todos estes exemplos e muitos outros que estão na literatura. E essas aqui são simplesmente que exponenciais é, desta é, expressão é, energia. É, para que vocês vejam é, a grande diferença entre que igual a 1 e que diferente de 1, assim que os momentos são importantes, Aqui está representado Q igual a 1. Então, esta é a resposta que forneceria para este problema mecânica estatística de Boltzmann. Q igual a 1 e Q diferente de 1 coincidem aqui, mas quando vocês têm muitas décadas, como é o caso neste experimento, 
a mecânica estatística de Boltzmann Gibbs pode ser bilhões de vezes errada. Vocês observam aqui a quantidade de décadas. O valor de Q em todos esses experimentos gira em torno de 1,14 e o valor da temperatura, que são os únicos dois parâmetros que têm essencialmente esta expressão, é este Q e esta temperatura. Ela é 0,13 GeV a comparar com as massas dos pinhos, que são também 0,13 ou 0,14 GeV. Para que vocês possam apreciar o que, que significa ter experimentos em 14 décadas e curvas teóricas que concordam com esses experimentos em 14 décadas, temos aqui uma representação da energia de uma partícula livre em log log, aqui tem um momento, e aqui vocês têm o caso dos prótons, aqui tem os casos dos elétrons, mas peguemos o caso dos prótons. Aqui vocês têm a expressão de Newton. Então, essa é P quadrado sobre 2M, certo? Mas a expressão de Einstein mostra que, a partir de um certo momento, esta curva é abandonada e entra na curva que, a azul que está aqui. Desde esta bifurcação até as mais altas energias que são observadas no projeto OG, as energias de Extreme Energy Cosmic Rays, 10 potência 8 tera electron volt, desde esse ponto até esse ponto, temos aproximadamente 10 décadas. 10 décadas. No exemplo anterior, temos 14 décadas. Isso mostra a, a, o quanto é impressionante este resultado experimental e teórico. Vamos a outro exemplo. Esse é um Physical Review Letters que foi publicado 20 anos atrás por Johan Rafelski, um estudante dele na época, e eles fizeram eh, a, os cálculos da difusão eh, de um quark eh, charm num plasma de quark gluon, em, em, digamos, uma espécie de equilíbrio térmico e encontraram que o valor que funciona é Q igual a 1.11. Aqui 1.11, aqui 1.14. E agora vamos ao resultado muito interessante que eu queria apresentar para vocês, motivo pelo qual sugeri aos organizadores de apresentar esta palestra, foi para apresentar para vocês este resultado do Ayrton Deppmann, da USP, Eugênio Mejias, de Granada, e Débora Menezes, de Florianópolis. Então, na base da teoria de Young Mills, utilizando QCD em um loop, na aproximação de um loop, eles obtiveram esta linda relação que expressa Q em função de número de cores e número de sabores. Aqui vocês têm, então, uma expressão analítica obtida de primeiros princípios. Isto não tem nada a ver com o fitting. Isto é uma expressão obtida eh, diretamente dos fundamentos da mecânica estatística, que são a dinâmica. Dinâmica que pode ser newtoniana, pode ser quântica, pode ser QCD, isso é uma outra questão. Mas é obtida da dinâmica. Então, se vocês pegam estes dois números, igual a 3 e 6, dá Q igual a 8 sétimos, que é 1.14. Exatamente o que é observado nos experimentos no LHC no CERN. Mas se vocês utilizam, em vez de 6, utilizam 3, quer dizer, a simetria S é o 3, Q dá 10 dividido por 9, com esta fórmula, e isso dá 1.11, que é exatamente o resultado obtido por Rafelski. 20 anos atrás. Para terminar, eu gostaria de apresentar um resultado é, em altas energias no espaço. Então, Christian Beck publicou uns quatro anos atrás é, este resultado, onde aparecem é, aqui o equipamento o observatório AMS-02, liderado por é, Ting. e aqui estão os resultados que o fluxo 
en función de energía, de positrons y electrons. Y ambos casos pueden ser eh, fitados bien por Q exponenciales y los valores de Q envolvidos son 13 dividido por 11 o entonces 11 dividido por 9, que curiosamente son números racionales, simples, iguales a los que aparecieron aquí. No sé si es una coincidencia o no, es eh, una cuestión a ver. Entonces, dito esto, yo presento la capa de un libro que publicamos unos, un mes atrás, con un matemático de los Estados Unidos, Sabir Umaro, fiel propio, donde ustedes tienen los fundamentos matemáticos de la mecánica estadística no extensiva que acabo de describir eh, brevemente. Ainda este ano deve aparecer a segunda versão deste livro, que apareceu em 2009, e agora a versão atualizada deverá aparecer, talvez, daqui a alguns meses. Com isto, agradeço a vocês e retiro sharing. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Cassandrino, pelo seu toque bem interessante. É... Essa. Deixa eu, deixa eu abrir o. o para, coisa, para perguntas. Era, você tem alguma pergunta? Agora parece que está com o microfone fechado. Está com o microfone fechado, Era. Não, eu não estava fazendo pergunta, não. Muito obrigado. Ah, tá. Então, ah, tá legal. Não, não. Constantino, parabéns. Tudo bem. Parabéns, sobretudo, ao Ayrton, à Débora e ao Eugênio. É, maravilhoso o trabalho deles, né? Muito maravilhoso. É. É, esse, esse trabalho é interessante. Eles, eles derivaram isso a partir do, simplesmente da teoria de Young Mills, na zona que se e aí eles chegaram nesse valor. É isso, né? Eu entendi. Se você quiser detalhes, tem que perguntar é. aos autores, porque ah. naturalmente é uma questão técnica sim, sim, sim. que eu não domino. É interessante que é, esse valor aí, né, do, do que, que eles obtiveram, é o é que é, tem no LHC. Né? Ou seja, é. parece que é. tem alguma, alguma relação com a, com a QCD mesmo. Mas isso é uma coisa bem interessante. E também com o trabalho de Rafelski. Sim, sim, sim. Mas aí você tem que usar o número de cores diferente. Né? Quer dizer, o número ah. de flavor. Esse, é, número de sabores diferentes. Três de sabores vez. diferentes. É. Ah, tem, uma questão, tem uma pergunta aí. É... Tepman? Sei lá quem é. Quem levantou a mão aí? Sou, sou eu, Ayrton Depman. Ah, ah, eu, tá. eu, ah, eu sou o primeiro autor do trabalho. Ah, tá, tá. Legal. É. Não, é, era só para comentar. É um comentário, na, na verdade, sobre... sobre... É, esse trabalho ele você ele tá está com de uma fechado aí eu tô na verdade eu tô num computador que não tem câmera é, ah tô... perfeito por isso me desculpem, me desculpem. É, então esse, esse trabalho na verdade ele sai de uma análise de aspectos fundamentais da teoria de Young Mills né? e que é uma teoria renormalizável e ela é renormalizável por ser invariante por escala então, a gente usa essa invariância por escala e técnicas de fractais para obter um, um acoplamento efetivo é, que dá uma expressão analítica. E quando a gente, no caso da QCD, a gente usa uma aproximação de, de um loop, que é válida lá em... em para a QCD é válida em alta energia, e, e usa essa relação para obter a... a o valor de Q em função do número de cores e número de sabores para aquecer. E o interessante é que, é, com, com essa teoria que a, que a gente tem, usando essa, esses conceitos de fractais, a gente obtém distribuições que são Q exponenciais, e daí a relação com a, Q, com a SQ, né? com a estatística não extensiva. Então, hum. tem esse aspecto bastante interessante do trabalho que explica por que as 
distribuições em alta energia seguem a Q exponencial e determina o valor de Q nesse caso. Em alta energia, os, a gente usa uh, o número de sabores igual a 6 porque as energias são altas, as massas uh, de uhum. quark são, são pequenas comparadas com a energia do sistema. Assim. Agora, quando a gente se aproxima da estrutura de Hadrons, uh, a gente tem que levar em conta as massas e aí eu coloco explicitamente a massa do quark, o que vai eliminar uh, a contribuição dos quarks pesados e aí, ou de forma equivalente se usa o número de, de sabores igual a 3. Uhum. Era isso. Ah, legal, bem interessante. Eu usar a aproximação com o caso da, da, da física nuclear, digamos assim. Talvez oh. eu possa comentar que anos atrás eu me encontrei com John Ellis, o teórico é, de muitos anos no CERN, e eu perguntei para ele, você está sabendo que os resultados no LHC são fitados com Q exponenciais? E ele me disse, sei. Você acha que com QCD se poderia obter esse resultado? Ele disse, acho que não. Mas o valor de Q, talvez sim. É exatamente o que ilustraram o Ayrton, a Débora e o Eugênio. Eles uhum. deduziram com argumentos de QCD, deduziram o valor de Q. Bacana. Tem alguma pergunta mais? Deixa eu ver aqui. Não estou vendo ninguém com a mão levantada. Não. Bom, acho que eu vou terminar essa sessão, então, agradecendo a todos aí. Agradeço ao Constantino e a todos os outros speakers, o André, o é, Gay também está aí. Então, é, nós voltamos à tarde, então, para as sessões paralelas, né? Tá certo, Gay? Tá certo, é. Voltamos à tarde. Voltamos agradeço, à tarde. Agradeço a todas as apresentações muito qualificadas, muito boas. As perguntas, a audiência. À tarde a gente retorna. Tá okay. bom. Então, tchau, até mais. Tchau, pessoal. Até mais tarde.